Gil, you want to gavel us in? Or some equivalent? There we go. Good morning. Welcome back. Um, thank you all for coming back today. Uh, we had a great day yesterday. I look forward to a great day today. Uh, thank you to the new members for we didn't scare you off and uh, you're back. I don't see any absences. Uh, but again, just a refresher for today, please, there are no, what's the politically correct word for stupid? Um, oh, I just said it. Um, what's the politically correct word for? Uh, there are no questions that are out of line. Please ask questions freely. Anything that comes to mind, jot, jot them down on whatever piece of paper you have or electronic device that you like. And please, at the end of a presentation or during a free flow of uh, ideas, ask that question and do not be timid. So I look forward to everything we have going on today. I look forward to a great day. All right, so just to review a few things, I just want to cover our meeting rules for the day. Uh, as you all know, I'm going to ask you to hold all questions until the end of the presentation. In fact, today we're going to do a slightly different. For this beginning panel, I'm going to ask you to hold all of your questions until the first three presentations are done. They want to be able to make sure that they're painting the complete picture of 235F. Uh, so they want to be able to tell you the whole story and get it completely together. And afterwards, we'll do a general Q&A so that you can ask anything. Uh, just before we begin the q and I'll poll you folks. If you feel like we need to take a short break in between, we can absolutely do that. Uh, please help us to adhere to the agenda timeline just by staying on topic. Uh, do not dominate or hold side conversations. I'm going to let you know all the microphones right now are slightly on, just like always. Even these right here at the front panel, the microphones are on. So if you're having a side conversation, it will get picked up in the speakers and it will most likely be on the recordings that we have. Uh, please make sure that you do state your name and affiliation before speaking. We need to make sure that we get a accurate record of who says what for the minute transcription. And you guys did a great job of respecting other people's points of view yesterday and that's going to continue through to today, I'm sure. One more thing I want to ask you to do is to please put your cell phones and pagers on silent. We want to make sure that all of our attention is up here at the front of the room and hearing everything that's going on. Are there any questions about what we're doing today, how we're going to proceed? You folks ready? Yeah, I'll get you a clicker. Oh, no, I need mine. All right, so let's start off with Randy. Oh, you're going to get mic'd? Okay. So we'll get started in just a minute as soon as Randy gets mic'd up. Uh, one short announcement is when we do take a break and when we break for lunch, there are some you know, touchy-feely, hands-on displays in this back room over here for the cab members if they want you to be able to get a picture of what it's like for the folks working in the facility. So they've got a display back there. When we take a break, feel free to step in and take a look at what they've got so that you can really get a better feel for what they're doing. Randy? So, okay. Um, I was originally going to talk from my chair, but then I thought I need to point at some of these pictures to help you understand it, so I'll stand up and do this. My name is uh, Randy Clendenning. I'm the DOE program manager for the 235F activities that we're engaged in. Um, there's a picture of the facility for, uh, I understand there's uh, new board members. Uh, for those of you uh, that have been to the previous briefings I've given, you'll recognize some of this. I'm going to go through a brief history, if you will, and description of the facility. Uh, Jeff Hasty will go through uh, the activities that we're engaged in, the work that's been going on, and then Brian Hennessy will walk through uh, a, an overview of the regulatory process uh, and some of the different things that we'll have to go through uh, to go achieve this vision uh, that we have. Uh, so there's a picture of the facility. That's a quote out of your work plan. Um, what we'd like to do today is lay out the vision. When I've briefed you before, I've told you about the activities that we've been doing in response to a board recommendation uh, to remove uh, material from the facility to reduce the risk. Um, what we're going to go through today is a plan uh, that we have uh, to go forward with not only that, but also looking at once we get to a deactivated facility, then 
from that point going forward all the way to a decommissioned facility, which would be done, completely done. Um, that would, it, that'll, accept, that'll end up accelerating the strategy for getting to the decommissioned facility by many years, and you'll hear some of that uh, as people go through the presentations. What we'd like you to consider as we go through this today is we would be interested in your opinion and feedback uh, on our approach uh, and, and what you think of it. Um, and once we get through the presentations, uh, we'll entertain questions uh, on all that. If, if you absolutely just can't stand it, go ahead and ask, but otherwise uh, we'll do it at the end. So with that, um, uh, like I said, this is a out of your work plan. Uh, I'm not gonna read it to you. This is a placement I handed out uh, that we've put together that's kind of a picture, um, a cartoon, I guess, of this whole strategy that we've laid out pictorially. Um, what is up here would be the activities that are engaged in getting to a deactivated facility. Uh, most, most, a lot of this was things that we were already going to do uh, in response to the board's recommendation. Uh, there are a couple of additional things in there. This part down here is the part, the newest part of our strategy, which would be uh, accelerating our activity so that we can get the facility decommissioned a lot sooner. Um, and you have copies of those, so I thought that you may want to refer back to it. That way you don't have to flip through the so slide presentation because as people talk today, it, it will be in a little more detail, but the, the big picture is all contained on that place map. Um, we have a panel today uh, that's gonna help and we'll be here to answer questions. Uh, Chris Bergerens, the uh, Director of uh, Environmental Compliance and Area Completion Project for SRNS. Uh, Vern Munahan is the Facility Manager for F&E Area. He was not able to join us. Uh, something came up back at the ranch at the last minute uh, and he wasn't able to get here. Um, Jeff Hastie is the SRNS project manager for the work we're doing. Uh, he'll be giving the presentation following mine. Uh, Jack Musel is the design authority engineer uh, for 235F and the work and the activities that we're doing. Brian Hennessy is the DOE federal facility agreement program manager. He'll be giving the presentation uh, following Jeff's on kind of an overview of the regulatory process. Uh, and then me, I'm the, like I said, the DOE uh, program manager for this. So, and like I said, if you've heard me do this before, the history part hasn't changed much since the last time I did it. Um, 235 was originally constructed. It was one of the earliest facilities that was constructed out there back in the very early 50s. Um, it's a brick. It's a blast resistant, windowless facility. Uh, gives the dimensions. The walls are 14 inches thick. There's, I gotta think, maybe three doors and then this roll up Oh, whoops, operator error. This roll-up door here is the main way to get things in and out of the building. Um, that on the bottom is a, a newer aerial picture of it. Um, over the years, it's had several missions. Uh, as I said, it was one of the earliest buildings uh, out there. It was originally designated as Sea line uh, Its original mission uh, was to build triggers. Uh, it was never equipped, and that mission was canceled before it was ever equipped for that. Uh, and then it was outfitted uh, to start the progression of uh, the 238 mission. Uh, the first mission was to, had a, there's a facility that's still there called the actinide billet line. Uh, that was an area where they made the billets, which are chunks of material that would be irradiated in the reactor uh, on, and that's the beginning of the process to produce the 238. Uh, the next mission was the PEF facility, which is a, it still is there. It's a smaller version, uh, as you might guess, from experimental facility to do a lot of uh, trials and experiments and things in preparation for what finally became uh, the facility that is there today that we've been talking about. Uh, and the, the plutonium fuel form facility is the, the bigger facility and the MET labs where they did a lot of testing. But those are, those are also, dang it. These are also the primary facilities where the, uh, predominant amount of the plutonium resides uh, that, we've have, that we have to go in to remove. In fact, um, most all of it is in this one, um, in the PUF facility. In the 70s, the building was reconfigured. The billet line was shortened. 
and they put in the version of what is today the plutonium fuel form facility, um, which is the facility we've briefed, and I believe you have a picture that Jeff will talk about uh, that shows all the glove boxes. Um, the metallurgical process in the building were shut down around 1990, it was in the late 80s. Uh, they almost literally turned out the lights and left. It wasn't quite that extreme, but it was pretty close. Um, the final mission of the facility was a, a storage facility for uh, nuclear materials uh, around the complex. As you can guess, windowless, big brick, it, it was suited for that kind of a mission, and it performed that mission uh, up until the mid, up until around 2006. Um, the Puff facility uh, is the, after the billets were irradiated, uh, they went to H Canyon through HB line, and the 238 was separated and sent back to building 235F, where it was introduced that one. It was introduced into the cell line here, and then it went through a process this direction, over here, and then out of cell nine. So uh, pictorially, this is cell one, and I think that is cell two. So there are, th there are three windows on cell one, so there are two other windows outside of this picture that you can't see. Um, but that's what it looked like back in the day. <laughs> um, the material was used uh, for the construction of RTGs, uh, radio thermoelectric generators, uh, that were manufactured by the department for NASA uh, to use in deep, deep space probes. Uh, as you might guess, solar doesn't work. The further you get away from the sun, the less good that does you. So uh, these were a convenient and relatively small way to power deep space satellites. Um, this is... Uh, a picture that we have of some of the components that were actually manufactured. These punches and presses uh, were what was used to take the plutonium from its very, very fine state and compress it into either spheres or pellets. Um, there's an example of a, a sphere. This was the early version uh, of, the, of the heat sources that were produced in the facility. These are uh, I think this is a mock-up, but the real ones, this would be iridium. They were, they were welded, the, the spheres of plutonium were clad and welded into it, iridium hemispheres. Uh, the later versions were more of a pellet configuration, um, but that's some of the stuff that, was, that would have been used inside of all these components. Um, I'm not going to talk much about this. This is an ex a kind of a blow-up of what uh, one of those heat sources would look like on a satellite when it's put together. There's a satellite. Jeff is going to have a video in his presentation that'll have a lot more detail. It's actually a pretty cool video, uh, and go, it will go through some of this. But uh, one of the things that made plutonium-238 really suitable for this is um, the decay is very energetic, and it generates a lot of heat. I mean, that, that's not colored. It's glowing uh, from the decay heat. So I'll run through uh, a brief, some pictures uh, before uh, that we have, some pictures we have of some of the various cells. There are nine of them. Uh, as I said, the material was introduced into cell one. Um, well, I'm not going to read it to you. They, the material was introduced into cell one as an oxide. Uh, plutonium-238 is predominantly, it, it emits a very energetic alpha particle. Um, and then it has some low, lower energy uh, X-ray gamma stuff. Um, the neutron field that you get from it uh, is from an interaction with oxygen uh, between the plutonium and the oxygen. So to try to minimize that, they would go through and try, they would, they would use oxygen. They wanted to enrich it and drive it to 16 because it minimized to the extent they could the neutron generation. So there was a part of this process where they actually tried to, to force an oxygen, oxygen exchange with the PU oxide uh, to try to minimize the neutron dose to the people that were going to be working with it. Um, the, the material was ball milled uh, in this cell down to extremely fine particles, one micron or less. Um, it was, then the, it was pressed into those uh, shapes that I showed you early. Forms were spheres, later forms were pellets, um, and then cell line 
if you look at the picture of the cell lines, you'll see cell one through five is on one side, what we call the east side, and then six through nine is on what we call the west side. Um, cells one through five were maintained uh, in an argon atmosphere. Uh, cell three uh, had no processing. It's a small cell. Uh, you ba it's very difficult. It, it's small-ish. It's hard to access. A lot of these cells have multiple glove ports where you can put gloves in and actually get in there and do work. This one only has one. So at b and there are shield doors in the facility, so it's hard to get to, and at best, you've got one arm just to kind of move stuff uh, through it, basically. Um, cell four had a, a lot of activities. It had a wing cabinet on it. Uh, cell one had two wing cabinets. Um, cell four had one wing cabinet. That's where the, uh, oxide, the, the spheres were uh, fired, heated to extremely high temperatures. Um, and then there was a mixture uh, of the two that were pressed into the, the shapes that would later be welded. Uh, and then here, I actually have the size. The, in 78 to 80, the spheres were about 250 grams. And then from 1980 forward, it was a 150 gram pellet. Um, I didn't point it out on the previous slides, but I'm not gonna go back. If, if you look at your slide package, this is kind of what it looks like today. When we started out on this endeavor, you couldn't see what was in the cells. So the first thing we had to do is remove the outer parts of the shield windows and clean the inner glass off. There was the shielding material between the two windows, which was about a foot, was water. And there was stuff growing in there. We're not sure what it was, but it, it, you couldn't see through it. So once we got, we thought removing the water would help, uh, it was actually covering the inner window. But anyway, we got it taken apart, we cleaned the inner window, uh, put some lighting on the outside looking in, and you can see there's, there's just junk laying around. It was just left. Uh, cell one, uh, if you look at the pictures that are in your presentation, there was a lot of junk laying around in cell one, and I think Jeff has some uh, pictures of that too. This is what it looked like in an older picture. I don't know a date for that, uh, but it, it's an older one that I found that, that showed what it looked like back when it was clean and in use. Um, this is cell five. Um, the material was transported from the east side to the west side in uh, a transfer mechanism they called a rabbit. It was a tube that ran under the floor. Uh, this is the entry to it, and then it goes down out of the cell over to cell six and then back up again. Uh, but the thing here I'd like to point out is plutonium's very aggressive uh, with its attack on metals. These, this is a manipulator arm that's aluminum, and I'm guessing but don't know, this is probably aluminum, but the white stuff you see on it is essentially rust. This whole pile of stuff is the rust and things that have basically fallen off of these components over time as they've sat there. Uh, that was one of the purposes of the argon, was to, to minimize that kind of an interaction, uh, but they shut that off when they left. Um, this is cell six. This is kind of the, the neatest gee whiz picture we have of when everything was nice and new. This is what it looks like now. Uh, there's the other side of that rabbit. Uh, you can see there's a chain hoist in here. This is the cell where they did the welding. Um, it was inerted also with helium, uh, and they did tungsten welding in there where they'd take the spheres uh, and weld either the, the hemispheres or the pellets together. Um, that's what it looked like when it was all shiny and newer. Um, quite a difference. Uh, in cell seven, that was primarily used after cell six, it went here and it was used primarily to decontaminate uh, the exterior of the, the cell, of the sphere or the pellet. Um, and then cell eight was some additional decontamination uh, of, the, of, the thing, of the spheres and pellets. You can, there were cases where we couldn't get all of the stuff off of the window. <laughs> That's kind of what it looked like all over the window before we started trying to clean it. Um, but you can see there's leftover stuff, parts, hoses in there. Um, this is a, an older picture of when it was in use. Uh, and then cell nine is the last cell uh, where they did uh, leak testing and their final inspections and everything. And it exited the glove box line through this hatch and it went down and outside the back of the cell. Uh, this would be the back of the cell. Um, So I think I've kind of run you through the history. 
Um, I could talk a little bit about plutonium. I could talk actually quite a bit, but I'll just tell you that um, this, this isotope of plutonium is a particularly nasty one. Uh, it's very hazardous. Uh, the neutron dose rates, the alpha that it emits, uh, a very, an extremely minute amount of it, uh, if it were to inadvertently be inhaled, uh, could, could cause problems that uh, where you would, uh, very small amount of it, if you inhaled it, you would likely exceed uh, DOE's dose thresholds and limits for the year. So it's, it, Jeff will talk about how they have to work with it, how they're dressed out, but it's, it's bad stuff. It can be controlled. It can be worked with safely, but in doing all of that, it just goes slow. So uh, I'll leave it with that, and Jeff can walk you through some of the things we're doing in response to the board recommendation, uh, and then the other things that we're planning to do uh, to try to move forward and accelerate uh, the decommissioning. Okay, I am Jeff Hasty. I'm the Risk Reduction Project Manager. I work for SRNS 235F. So we'll walk through the recommendation 2012-1 to the Defense Board, the Defense Board wrote, and uh, we'll talk about completed actions, the scope of work, the progress to date, some of the challenges we face doing this work, and uh, we'll show the video that Randy had mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about the path forward for our project. So as Randy mentioned, the Puff facility when it was shut down, there was not a lot of effort taken to clean it out. So a lot of material was left there, uh, left behind. When the, when the facility was shut down, the intent was to restart it. That never happened due to mission changes and budgets and uh, things of that nature. Um, so the building sat vacant for many years. In 2012, the Defense Board wrote a recommendation to DOE uh, requesting that the building be cleaned out. The reason they were interested in it because the material left behind if there were a seismic event followed by a full facility fire, the dose to the dose to co-located worker, the workers outside the building in the general area, would be approximately 11,900 rem. The DOE standard for that is 100 rem, so obviously it was a much more than DOE allowed in their standard. So the recommendation was written in, in May of uh, 2012. Uh, DOE accepted that recommendation and uh, the, the risk reduction project w was formed. Um, oh, thank you, Jack. Um, the recommendation, uh, we wrote an impl implementation plan to talk about uh, how we're going to do the work in the, impl in the implementation plan, had various milestones with completion dates attached to them that we've been working on uh, since 2013 and we're working on today and we'll cover some of that. So some of the completed actions, um, fire is the biggest issue at 235F. It's one of the things we want to avoid. So we went in and took the transient combustibles out of the building uh, and established a control program that limits what material goes back into the building. Just again, to limit the material that could be possibly burned. The fixed combustibles, you know, things hanging on the walls, cabinets, ceiling tiles, things of that nature, a lot of it was encapsulated and or isolated. We also went through the building uh, and, and looked at all the electrical circuits. Obviously, electricity is, is a potential spark or could cause a potential spark. So we went through and all the circuitry that was not needed was isolated, uh, the air gapped. Uh, also, knowing that we, we work on the project for some period of time, a lot of people in the general area, we, in, we developed emergency drills to, to practice uh, in the event of, of an accident at 235 that we can protect the people not only in the building working there but also the people in the adjacent facilities and F area, mocks and, and various areas around around 235F. The drills are, are we, we run drills periodically. Uh, we have a graded drill every year. We also run practice drills regularly just to ensure that we're staying abreast on, on, and up to speed on, on protecting the people there. Also, to allow us to do this work, we had to revise our safety basis. The safety basis is what gives us the permission to go do the work and tells us how we can go do our work and the controls we have to have in place so that that safety basis was revised to allow us to go in and start removing material from cells one through nine. One of the big things we did, we did go back and, and did better characterization of what was actually in the cells. Um, in order to do that, we had to go, as Randy mentioned earlier, pull the windows apart uh, to get better 
visibility into the cells. SRNL developed some, some instrumentation, some technology. They went in and, and did some better assay measurements for us to, to better understand not only how much material was in the cells, but where it was located at. They actually give us a, a picture that would show us where the hot spots were in the cells. So when, when we're working, we know where to concentrate our efforts. They did that for us before we started, and periodically as we go with, through the cells, they'll go back and reassay them again to tell us how we're doing, you know, where the hot spots are, if they moved, so we can, you know, again, concentrate our efforts in, in the area to get the most benefit for it. Prior to going into cells one through nine, um, you, you know, they sat vacant for a long time, the wiring in there corroded, so to ensure we had a safe environment, every penetration to the cell was isolated. Um, a lot of effort was taken going through every electrical lead going in, every mechanical feed going in, tracing it back and isolating it to make sure it was air gapped or blanked off, just to ensure the safety of our workers as they're in there working in the facility. And as I mentioned earlier, we did, we did restore cell infrastructure, um, which we had to install gloves into the, into the glove boxes. We put lights on the outside shining in just to give us some, some visibility uh, so that our workers could actually see what, what they're doing there. So the scope of work, you know, our, our job is to remove the material at risk, the MAR, we call it. Uh, and the, re the way we're doing that is, is we're, we're decontaminating. We're pulling out old equipment. The old equipment that's in there, it has plutonium on it. We're, so we're, we're pulling that material out. You saw some of the photos that Randy showed you. There's a lot of uh, oxidation on the floor. The oxidation is being swept up, put in cans and bagged out. Um, again, all that is, is removing the material from the puff cells. We are working in cells one and two now. Cell one, as Randy mentioned, that is the, the, source, the cell with probably over 90% of the holdup materials in cell one. Um, so as waste comes out, we do stage it and we put it in metal pails. And that's, staged, that's carried down to a different room in the building and stored there. And then SRNL comes in, our, our lab comes in, and they assay the waste cuts for us to tell us how much material, how many grams are in each, each pail. Once we know that, then we can then load the, load the pails in the drums. It's important for us to know how much we're putting in each drum because the drums will be shipped to e area for storage. e area has limits on how much they can store. We want to make sure that we package the waste where it can be stored safely in the in, in, in area. And then long term, it'll go down, be shipped to WIP. So again, everything we package today, we want to make sure that it's acceptable to WIP. That's the long term disposition for it, um, be buried in a salt mine in, in New Mexico. So the job, each job, typically each jump, we call it, each entry into the facility, uh, typically we have two risk reduction technicians. We'll have a rat protection uh, inspector, and they'll go into east maintenance, and uh, we'll show you a little bit more about east maintenance in a few minutes. Uh, they go in, typically they're in the area for about three hours. We have one person working in the glove, hands in gloves, while the other person is observing, and then, and then they'll swap out for 15, 20 minutes, and you'll see why in a minute, why it's important to swap out, just because of the work they're doing and the, the protective clothing they're, they're, they're wearing while they're doing the work. So this is just a layout of, of the PUF facility. Uh, the center area is called the SOB, the shift operating base. That area is the clean area. Uh, when the facility actually operated, that's where most of the work was done. It was done with, with manipulators that were hanging on the, on the windows. All the manipulators are out of service. They're no longer in use. We have no plans on replacing the manipulators. It's just a very, very high hazard job to go do that. Uh, it's something we, we've tried to avoid, and, and today we've been able to work around not using manipulators. Uh, we believe we'll be successful in not doing that at all. The area on the right side of the screen where it says HCA slash ARA, um, that's a high contamination area, airborne radiation area. That's east of maintenance. That's where all the work's done. Uh, that's where the workers go in. Uh, we'll talk about the PPE in here in just a few minutes. They wear and they go in that area. Uh, that's where the glove ports are. It gives them access to material. And all the waste that's bagged out comes out the maintenance cabinet on cell one. Um, that's the only entry point we have into the cells. It all comes out one, one general location. Some of the challenges, we kind of talked through some of this before. There are very few penetrations in the cell. Uh, cell one is, is the largest cell. Um, there are uh, two sets of glove ports in cell one, uh, one on the north end, one on the south end, uh, which makes it very difficult to reach all areas of the cell. Um, so we use long handle tools. We work with SRNL. We have a clean mock-up that we use uh, to, to develop our tools. Uh, on, on, in the picture here, you see one example of one of the tools we, we've used. 
We'll go to the mock-up. We'll tell us know what, what we need. They'll go fabricate it, bring it back to us. We'll take it to mock-up again, try it, see if it works for us, make any changes needed, and then we'll implement that to our facility. Um, again, very difficult to reach all areas of the cells, working through two gloves. You have limited visibility. One of the ways we combat the limited visibility from the guys actually working with the hands and the gloves, we have a person on the shift operating base side with a headset on, communicating with the guy with his hands and the gloves, letting him know okay, where things are located at, making sure he don't touch something he should not be touching. Um, one of our biggest concerns in doing this work is a puncture wound. Uh, we do a lot of extreme measure to prevent from a puncture wound, and having the person on the other side of the glass watching him work as, as a way of prote helping protect him from grabbing something he shouldn't be grabbing or, or limited to the time he's got to be looking for, for materials. There are obstructions in the cells, there's furnaces in the cells, there's pieces of equipment in the cells we cannot remove, so we have to work around them, you know, pieces of equipment, and then the degraded conditions. Um, the top right hand picture, that's actually a picture of cell four, that's the wing cabinet, that's taken from East Maintenance. This gives you an idea what, what the, a wing cabinet looks like, they're all very similar in, in size and, and, um, and, and what they look like. And then the bottom picture there is just a picture of the interior, uh, interior of one of the cells. So some more of the challenges, as, as Randy mentioned, um, 238 is extremely hazardous. You know, so we want to protect our workers best we can. So when they go in and do the work, they wear two pair of, of coveralls, basically, and a fresh air hood. The fresh air hood is, is goes over the coveralls and air is supplied to them, so fresh air. They also wear a lead apron. Lead aprons about 15 pounds, um, very heavy, but also provides a lot of shielding for for their chest area. They're working against against the glass. Their arms are in, in the gloves, so very important to protect that area. We also wear lead sleeving. This covers from the wrist up to the elbow. Again, protect it's shielding, and we also wear tungsten, excuse me, borated gloves. These would come from the, from the medical medical field. It adds a lot of protection to the hands. It's where worn underneath all the, the underneath the gloves, just provide shielding to the hands with, from radiation. And then to protect from the puncture, we wear what's called a hog glove. Uh, it's just a very thick glove. Um, again, it's, it's to protect the worker from from the puncture wounds. In addition to the glove box glove. So as you can tell, there are a lot of a lot of layers of protection on the hands, which really limits your dexterity. Um, when you work in these gloves for any length of time, you know, it, it don't take long, your hands start cramping up. That's why got guys, they, they, they rotate out. They'll spend 15, 20 minutes actually packaging waste up. They'll pull their hands out, rack on, surveys their hands, make sure they're clean. They'll step to the side, to let the next guy come in, put his hands in, he'll work 15, 20 minutes as well. And they'll do that numerous times for about a three hour period. And then we'll typically come out at that point and send the people in. So it's a, again, it's a very tedious job. Um, the guys have done a great job learning the process, uh, finding ways to make it more efficient. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've done things, we put like anti-fatigue matting on the floor just to help, they're standing on concrete, so just give them a little cushion while they're standing there. Again, trying to make their job as comfortable as possible, but also as safe as possible as well. The, do the dosimetry, um, obviously their exposure to the radiation is very important to us. We want to limit that as much as possible. We also want to know real time what they're being exposed to. So we wear what's called multi-pack dosimetry. They wear finger rings, which will give you exposure to actually their hands. They wear forearm badges. Again, it gives an idea of what's being picked up on their forearms. We wear a chest badge, a head badge, and on the outside of the lead apron, we wear electronic dosimetry. Uh, that's our most conservative, that's outside of all the PPE, so real time they can look down at any time and see, okay, what field am I working in dose rate wise and how much have I picked up right now? So again, it's just a way we can, we can monitor that and ensure we're keeping our workers safe. Our RADCON has done a great job so far with this. Uh, we've done very well um, limiting the exposure, and that's based on limiting, limiting the time they spend. You know, we've learned, you know, you, you back up a few feet, it makes a difference on your exposure. So the guys were not physically working, if they're waiting for something to be take place, they'll still step back. And by doing that, pulling your hands back, it limits your exposure to your extremities. So the little things they've learned has helped us out control our dose, doses quite a bit. The video, which will be on the next slide, was, was taken, was made several months ago. Uh, it kind of rehashed some of this material we've already talked about. And that following the video, I'll give you an update on where we're at today.
NASA's deep space missions demand reliable power to enable rigorous scientific tasks under the harshest conditions. The general purpose heat source module, fueled by plutonium-238, is the essential building block for radioisotope power systems provided by DOE to NASA. From 1977 to 83, the Savannah River site manufactured DOE's iridium-clad PU-238 fuel pellets in a series of hot cells and shielded glove boxes. The blast-resistant 235F plutonium fuel form, or PUFF facility, was shut down in the mid-1980s. Based on assays, there is still unrecovered PU-238 in the PUFF cells, recognizing that the remaining material at risk, or MAR, would exceed the DOE standard for dose in a worst-case accident. The 235F risk reduction team was assembled to remove the material. For five years, the team has been training and preparing the PUFF facility for the real work that is about to start. Decontamination of cell number one. Cell one is the most contaminated cell. If you look at the PUFF facility as a whole, it holds about 1,500 grams of plutonium-238 and related radionuclides. The vast majority of that is in cell one. So we have to be very careful working in cell one. The submicron size PU-238 is highly mobile. An inhalation of a single eight micrometer particle could result in a worker exceeding the annual allowable dose. To come down and clean up cell one, which is probably one of the most contaminated places on site, it's kind of scary, but yet I have full confidence that we can do it and do it the right way. We've assembled a dream team of workers to perform this material removal. And these workers bring three things with them that are gonna make them successful. One is, they're knowledgeable, they're very experienced, they've done this kind of work before, they're intelligent, and then finally, they have a really strong questioning attitude. They are the team that's gonna make this happen and make it a success. Between seven and 7.15, we'll have a pre-job brief, where the first time sits down and he talks to everybody about the work for the day. We cover the procedure, we cover safety, we cover emergencies, we cover lessons learned. When you work, with the same people day in and day out. And you build relationships with those people to your left and your right. And everyone knows their role, and that, that brings about a confidence, of, uh, inspires confidence throughout the whole team. So we're trying to protect these workers as best as we can while they're inside working. Then we'll wear two pair of uh, coveralls, and we'll wear a fresh air hood. Uh, there are gonna be some times when we will have to wear a plastic suit. We actually wear three pair of latex gloves then you go inside of the cell itself to actually work and you go into some central research gloves. Those are pretty thick. And then based on the product that we're moving around and tools that we're using, then we put on some hex on the gloves. So that's another set of leather gloves. But I, I don't think too much protection is not enough. But then there has to be a fine balance about hand dexterity and moving around. And I, and I think we have struck the perfect balance at this point. All decon operations are directed step by step from the remote command center, utilizing the reader worker method, guaranteeing the work plan and procedures are safely followed. The work is divided into two phases for each cell. Uh, the first phase is to remove all the loose materials that are in the cell, uh, and then to disassemble small things and remove them through loadout locks. The loose equipment and parts are an interference to us doing decontamination of the cells. So there's actually plutonium adhering to those loose parts and materials so by removing from the cells, we also reach our objective, which is to remove the 238 from the cells. The potential for PU-238 cross-contamination during the bag-out process is elevated. Standardized DOE complex procedures reduces this risk. We have a uh, cut that we call this a beeline cut. It's one that we train them to. RCO surveys the bag. Once the bag surveyed, we then put it into a, another bag and it's placed into a five-gallon bucket. That bucket is taken up, then it's taken to a storage area. Second phase is to get decon materials in there and start wiping down uh, surfaces. We sweep the floor of the cells or sweep surfaces to remove any loose or visible contamination. Uh, then we'll do a dry wipe down. And then finally, we have built a special vacuum cleaner 
we'll set it up and we'll start vacuuming the surfaces within the, within the cell. The HEPA vacuum was customized by Savannah River National Laboratory, who has been a crucial partner at every step of the process. For the non-destructive assay, SRNL developed an enhanced characterization methodology that visually pinpoints contamination hotspots. With direct input from the risk reduction team, lab engineers and machinists developed and fabricated one-of-a-kind, lightweight, highly functional glove box tools to improve efficiency and dexterity. And as a final stabilization step for residual contamination, SRNL and Florida International University are investigating flame-proof fixative coatings. DOE fellow STEM students from FIU even observed a cold test and toured the PUP facility as part of the agency's drive to promote next-generation EM workforce development. The 235F risk reduction work is on track for a 2021 completion and final disposition calls for packaging and shipment to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico, the nation's only deep geological repository for nuclear waste. The objective of this project is to reduce risk associated with the facility. The way to do that is to remove more material at risk. And that will allow the Department of Energy to maintain it long term in a surveillance and maintenance mode, hopefully at a lower expense and much lower risk. Everyone knows their role, and that, that brings about a confidence throughout the whole team. We're actually ready to see what the training has afforded us the opportunity to be able to do. We're actually ready to show that we are capable to safely remove this bar. So I think it's a, a sense of excitement, but yet a little bit of humility at the same time, knowing that this responsibility has been given to this small team, but we're ready to do it. Okay, since the video was made, uh, we have been working in cell one um, and, and just recently started cell two. Uh, as the slide indicates, 150 waste cuts, waste cuts removed. Uh, since the slide was, was generated, we've, we're down to 190 waste cuts removed and 90 grams of material removed from primary cell one. Like I said, we just started working in cell two. Um, the two pictures there, I'll say the one on the left was taken in September and the one on the right was, was in January. You can see you know, the, the big pieces of uh, the holders, uh, piping, that kind of thing has been removed. And most of the oxidation, my oxide on the floor has been swept up and, and bagged out as well. So the work is continuing. Um, as, as we mentioned, it, it's very slow and very tedious, but uh, the guys again, are doing, doing a good job. They're, they're in there you know, every day working. So. so the path forward, We'll continue working in cells one and two based on our latest assay results for about 436 grams of material in cells one and two. Again, our goal is to remove as much of that as we possibly can uh, by the means we've already discussed. Um, in addition to, to removing the material, um, as we talked earlier, fire is, is, is a major impact. Uh, in, in, if we were to have an accident and fire were to get to the material at risk, that's where, that's where the, the exposure takes place. We're currently working with the engineering to, to look at how fires can occur at 235F, what accidents would cause a fire, and not only that, but how to, how to mitigate that fire. So they're going through looking at each area where MAR is present and trying to understand, okay, can a fire happen here? And if so, what can we do to, to, to prevent that fire from happening? And that's done in parallel with us removing materials as well. It's working dual paths there to, to, to minimize the, the risk there. We've also started looking at uh, plans for deactivating the building. Uh, deactivation, deactivation would make the building cold and dark. Basically what that would mean was all electrical feeds to the building would be isolated. The building still be, would, would still be under um, a vacuum. Um, Ventilation-wise, we have fans that are exterior to the building that pull, pull on the building uh, to maintain the, the, a negative pressure to the atmosphere. 
But again, by making the building cold and dark, if there's no electrical feeds going into the building, there's no sources of fire. So therefore, again, you, you limit the, the ability to have a fire, you limit the, the risk uh, to, the, to, the, to the workers to make the facility a safer place, also a much cheaper place to maintain. And you know, as we're doing this now, having the team current, we currently have to, to work on the, the deactivation activities is important. We have experienced workforce. We have people who are very knowledgeable of the building. So making these plans now to do this work now versus waiting uh, to some out year to do it uh, when we, we start from scratch, basically, is much more cost effective and um, the right thing to do. We also began working with the area completion project, which, which Ryan was out a few, you know, in a few minutes, but we want to make sure whatever we do with the project today, that we set them up to be successful in the future for, deactiv for decommissioning the building. Um, so we're working with them, trying to understand okay, how, how can we leave the building to make it uh, better for them to come do their work when the time comes to actually decommission the building, which Ryan will talk through. Ryan. screen okay that's the uh, forward button yep okay the top one's back. all right <clears throat> good morning everyone hello uh, board members South Carolina DHEC and EPA representatives uh, representatives of the public and uh, everyone else who's joining us this morning uh, my name is Brian Hennessy I am a DOE Savannah River employee uh, the Federal Facility Agreement Program Manager for a uh, good long while now. Um, these are some acronyms that we'll see. I'll probably explain them when we encounter them, so uh, not to worry. Um, the purpose, you've seen this before, this language comes directly from the board's work plan for uh, 2019. Um, the third bullet's a little confusing. Um, we don't intend to provide a recommendation. What we hope we will do is enable you to provide a recommendation. And um, the fourth bullet um, that I added there just explains that, uh, or states that we uh, are going to explain to you the, F the Federal Facility Agreement, FFA framework, for decommissioning any facility at the Savannah River site. So this is going to be general information about facility decommissioning and toward the end of my briefing we'll try to focus it down to 235F. In the beginning, 1993, when the Federal Facility Agreement uh, came into uh, being, uh, only what we call waste sites were listed. In other words, sites where there was known disposal or management of hazardous or uh, radioactive waste. Uh, generally, these sites are in the environment. Think of a uh, landfill, um, a basin or a lagoon, something of that nature. Um, contaminated soil, contaminated groundwater. Those were the um, sites of release of hazardous substance, either known or potential, uh, into the environment. And the FFA requires us to investigate those and if they need response action, to take action to reduce the human health and environmental risk to an acceptable level. Uh, so there were no buildings in the original FFA. Um, there were no buildings in the original RICRA permit, which is where a lot of the release sites in the FFA came from. Um, so, in a minute you'll understand why I mentioned this. Um, so since there were no buildings listed, there were no requirements for decommissioning buildings uh, or to decommission them at all. So in July of 2003, uh, DOE, EPA Region 4, and South Carolina DHEC 
signed a memorandum of agreement for achieving an accelerated cleanup vision. And uh, one of the significant things that this memorandum did was bring facility decommissioning into our, closer, into our cleanup process by incorporating uh, decommissioned facilities into the cleanup of areas. And uh, you've probably heard before that the 515 release sites that we track um, at uh, DOE uh, were aggregated into the areas where they exist so that they could be um, assessed more uh, efficiently. Um, let's see. We also established a process for determining whether or not the decommissioning of facilities requires an evaluation under CERCLA. Uh, there are over a thousand facilities belonging to EM at the Savannah River site. And when I say facility, I mean buildings of every manner, shape, and form. Some of them are nothing more than sheds, storage sheds, butler buildings, uh, very simple facilities that never uh, stored or managed anything hazardous or uh, radioactive. And this, in fact, is the majority of the facilities uh, at SRS. So we developed a graded approach so that we didn't have to throw all the same uh, intensity of evaluation into those very simple facilities as we do a facility like 235F or a produ former production reactor uh, or something in between. There's a graded approach that we developed for um, assessing facilities for decommissioning based on what we know about the process associated with that building, uh, where it's located, and uh, what type of materials or wastes were managed there. So we, about that time, we invented some uh, new parts of the Federal Facility Agreement. We added an Appendix K, which was a list of all the uh, EM facilities that we intended to eventually decommission. Um, we added a section XL, that's 40, uh, called decommissioning facilities uh, to describe that graded approach or that screening process for decommissioned facilities and uh, how a facility, if it needs to, will become part of an area for uh, later assessment when, the, when it's time for that area to be closed. And an appendix uh, K2, which is the other half of Appendix K, and that's the list of all the facilities that DOE, EPA, and uh, the state agree don't require any further evaluation because they were very simple and uncontaminated to begin with, or else they were completely um, cleaned up during their decommissioning. So there's um, Appendix C contains the list of all the areas. And there's a subpart of Appendix C that lists all the facilities in each area that require further evaluation. And that appendix, Appendix C and Appendix K, the list of uh, EM facilities, gets updated every year for approval by EPA in the state. OK. Um, very central to the idea of uh, decommissioning is the concept of end state. And I just want to tell you what we mean by the phrase end state. Um, it's the com final configuration of a facility when decommissioning is done. So in other words, first, a facility is deactivated by the organization that operated it. And then the closure organization will decommission it or take it to the state that it's going to remain in in perpetuity. Um, there are two end states that we generally talk about. One is demolition and removal, uh, where the facility is completely gone at the end of decommissioning, uh, either uh, utterly gone or else uh, just its foundation slab would be left. And the other uh, decommissioning end state is called in situ or in place, uh, meaning that uh, significant part of the building's exterior remains in place uh, after the facility has been placed in a stable, 
protective configuration. Um, and this is sometimes appropriate for facilities that are very hardened. Uh, they were designed and built to resist being uh, damaged or demolished during the Cold War. Um, and of course, the essence there is uh, that we have to be able to demonstrate by characterization uh, and modeling, fate and transport modeling, uh, that any hazardous or radioactive material left inside the facility will not uh, pose an unacceptable risk at any time in the future. Uh, we model for thousands of years out in the future after it's, uh, after we have to assume that the building is no longer there. If you model far enough out in the future, uh, robust concrete facilities turn to soil. Um, according to the way we model. We, the facilities aren't protected forever, in other words. Um, and sometimes the idea of demolishing and removing a facility, even though it sounds more thorough, it just would take an incredible amount of effort and money and the uh, risk um, is just not reduced uh, in any way proportionally to that effort and that uh, expenditure. And um, when we decide to decommission a facility in situ or in place, uh, it's only after, as I said, we can demonstrate that um, that material and its, or that facility and its contents uh, will not have a uh, unacceptable adverse effect at any time in the future. So the end state also, it's not just the building's gone or the building remains. Uh, the end state also includes details about what's left. In this case, in, two, in the case of 235, the end state, um, if the building remains, uh, would include how much plutonium-238 is left inside the facility, uh, what form is that plutonium in, um, and things of that nature. So here's an example of the first end state, demolition and removal. On the left, you see a building. On the right, you don't. Uh, it, it was demolished and removed. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> Let me apologize. No movies in this presentation. So th this is it. Enjoy this. Um, so yeah, the looks like a road, but actually the foundation of 232.1H is still there, the concrete slab. Uh, but there's nothing subgrade uh, at all. This is, a, uh, an, this is an example of an in situ decommissioning. This one is the uh, 105P reactor complex. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of structure still there. Decommissioning is finished. None of this will be removed. Um, but um, I should say that there was some removal of a very tall um, exhaust vent stack. Uh, I don't remember the height. Couldn't even guess. Could you? Is it 115 feet? 115 feet? 115? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 115 foot concrete vent stack was removed so that sometime in the future it wouldn't uh, deteriorate, fall over, and damage the roof of this facility. Uh, and some of the other roofs that, where you can see the light-colored concrete, they were uh, reworked uh, to add some slope so that water would, uh, would not uh, accumulate on the top of this facility, which would stimulate the growth of trees and other undesirable things. But before we could make a decision to close this facility in situ, we had to know what remained inside. A lot of radioactive material and hazardous material was removed during deactivation of this P reactor. And um, we had to show by modeling that anything that was left, any radioactive material that was left, such as the vessel, the reactor vessel, which itself had become irradiated during its operation, um, would not have an unacceptable effect on any environmental medium or uh, any receptor in the future. So here's a little bit about that graded approach to decommissioning that I mentioned. Not all facilities are created equal. Some of them are very simple. 
uncontaminated. Um, and for them, we use the first of three decommissioning models called the simple model. Uh, these are facilities that were clean uh, and uh, no further evaluation is needed. And that's basically known and decided before the decommissioning happens. Um, we would uh, produce a document called a facility decommissioning evaluation that would communicate to uh, EPA and South Carolina DHEC uh, what the history of this facility was, uh, that there was nothing um, hazardous or radioactive managed in it and no potential for any remaining material in there. So, <coughs> pardon me, when they, con when they concur on the simple model, there's no more evaluation of the facility. It's removed and we're done. And it would be listed then on Appendix K2, the facilities that require no further evaluation. The second decommissioning model is called the integrated sampling model. And this is for facilities where we're really not sure. We know that there may have been hazardous and radioactive materials managed in it or used in its operation, but we're not sure whether anything remains uh, in its, in its uh, inactive and deactivated state. So we do some sampling uh, before decommissioning. Then we decommission and we do some sampling afterwards to determine whether there is some residual material that could pose a risk in the future. And um, if that's the case, the, the facility is added to Appendix C4 and it will be evaluated during the closure of that area for its um, contribution to the overall risk in that area. <coughs> pardon, pardon me. Third is the circular model. And this is for facilities where uh, we know that there were complex operations involving hazardous or radioactive material. Uh, it's likely that at the end of operations there is hazardous and or radioactive material held up in that facility in some location, in some form. And um, it is unlikely that deactivation is going to be able to remove it all to a level that uh, would not require any further evaluation. So we, we do a, a CERCLA evaluation um, to determine a protective end state for that facility. Now there are two flavors of CERCLA evaluation that you see here. Uh, the first is the removal action. It is slightly more streamlined. Um, and this is the, this is the mechanism of uh, facility decommissioning under CERCLA that was recommended in 1995 in a joint memo from EPA and Department of Energy uh, for all facilities. They didn't, they didn't envision any other type of uh, CERCLA evaluation for facilities. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and let me say uh, up front that whether it's a removal action or a remedial action that results in the decommissioning, there is public participation either way. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. So under the removal action, uh, we would prepare a document called an ECA, an engineering evaluation cost analysis, which would be an evaluation of the remaining material in the facility and a comparison of some potential end states for that facility. It would describe the method for its decommissioning, uh, the end state or what it looks like when it's done, what form the remaining hazards are left in, and how any waste generated during decommissioning would be dis dispositioned. And normally it takes about nine months to to uh, complete that evaluation. Uh, remedial action would typically be for a more complex facility. And we have used it to decommission one of those reactors. Um, but before I go to remedial, let me just say that removal, that ECA, that engineering evaluation cost analysis report, would be the report that would be released for public review and comment. 
for a period of 30 or 45 days, typically. <coughs> Remedial action results in the document that you see more commonly um, in um, environmental bulletins and for public review and comment, you see proposed plans more often than you see uh, ECAS. Uh, the remedial action uh, normally uh, is taken after DOE does a feasibility study, which is like an ECA, a comparison of some alternatives for dispositioning the facility. Some different end states will be compared, just like in an ECA, only it follows a little different format, has different rules. And um, after the feasibility study has been reviewed and approved by EPA and South Carolina DHEC, uh, we will issue the document that you're familiar with called the proposed plan. Here is the remedy that we propose. And in the case of a facility, like a reactor or 235F, it would describe uh, the remaining hazards in the building, the end state that the decommissioning will achieve, and um, that will take about that, that proposed plan and record of decision. Uh, the record of decision would uh, be issued by DOE with concurrence from EPA and the state after public comment on the proposed plan uh, had been considered takes a little longer. We estimate 16 months for the uh, preparation, review uh, of a proposed plan and the issuance of a record of decision. So as I said, either way, remedial or removal, there's public participation. Uh, the difference would just be the document that the public uh, gets for review. An ECA in the case of a removal, a proposed plan in the case of a remedial. Um, and in either case, the facility remnant, or what's left at the end of uh, decommissioning, would be added to Appendix C4, so it would be evaluated again at the time of area completion or area closure. Examples of circular model decommissioning, uh, the R reactor building, which you saw a minute ago, uh, all the buildings in the M area, production area, if you ever go through M area on a public tour, you'll see a bunch of con uh, concrete slabs um, in an open field where there used to be production, production facilities. And the heavy water components test reactor, which used to be a enormous eyesore in B area, and it's now gone. Um, the above ground portion is gone. There were, there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of a few components left underground, but they were grouted in place and covered, covered with a durable slab. But that was uh, arrived at through a circle evaluation. This is just a depiction that's in your slides of the decision process for whether a facility would be decommissioned uh, in accordance with the simple model, the circle model on the right, or the integrated sample model in the middle and what would happen to the facility at the end of its decommissioning, what, uh, how it would be dispositioned in the, in the federal facility agreement. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that. I basically just described the thought process for which of those mechanisms would be used. So for, facil for facility decommissioning, there is some documentation that we uh, more or less agreed to use here at the Savannah River site. They won't find these things in CERCLA or the, its regulations anywhere. We came up with this methodology at SRS. Before decommissioning, we prepare a facility decommissioning evaluation that describes the building, uh, what it was used for, what the processes were that occurred in it, uh, what we know about it, and the recommendation of simple integrated sample or circular model for decommissioning. An EPA and South Carolina DHEC concur on that recommendation, and then we go decommission. Uh, after decommissioning, for a simple model facility or an integrated sample sampling model facility, we would produce a, a post-decommissioning report called the Decommissioning Project Final Report. It would describe the facility in a little less detail than the FDE 
but it would describe uh, in great detail the condition that the building was left in at the end of its decommissioning and any data that were collected and it would propose that the building can either go to Appendix K2 for the clean buildings or to Appendix C4 for the buildings where the remnant is likely still got some contamination that should be looked at again later when the area is closed. And if the CERCLA model is used, we don't do a DPFR because there would be CERCLA documents that would enter at that point. There would be a ECA and an action memo and uh, either a removal action report at the end or if a uh, remedial action was done, there would have been a proposed plan, a record of decision, and afterwards a uh, remedial action completion report. Those would take the place of the normal decommissioning documents. So, um, if somebody gave this slide a bad title, uh, this is not actually the timeline for 235F. This is more accurately the timeline for F area. F area, which has a lot of facilities and uh, a few uh, remaining waste sites. So just with that clarification, I want to say that in Appendix E of the FFA, which has our schedules and milestones in it, um, there is an interim record of decision scheduled for October 2026. And uh, for any remedies that are recommended in that or selected in that record of decision, they would start by January 2028. Uh, this interim rod currently includes the remnants of some facilities that have already been decommissioned. Uh, there were a lot of buildings in F area that were decommissioned in the early part of the 2000s. There are some underground process pipelines. There are some historical uh, spill sites that were documented when they happened and, and uh, emergency response was taken at the time, but we have to investigate whether there's any remaining material at those spill sites that needs uh, final response action and uh, things of that nature. It was not anticipated that this interim record of decision for F area would include the decommissioning of any major facilities. And by those, I mean 235F, the F Canyon, which is way larger and more complicated than 235F, uh, and maybe some others. And in Appendix E, there's a final record of decision date in September of 2039 and the remedial action start for uh, those remedies would be in December 2040. And uh, typically that would include major facilities in an area. So um, what we have here, or what Randy and Jeff uh, have been discussing, is an opportunity uh, to take this 235F facility which is, being, uh, which, uh, uh, which is having risk reduced by the removal of material at risk, uh, plutonium-238. And uh, instead of following one of these existing schedules for F area to perhaps accelerate the final decommissioning of 235F, uh, essentially by rolling continually uh, from these deactivation activities more or less directly into decommissioning and having the facility in its long-term safe and protective end state uh, several years earlier than currently scheduled in the FFA. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of points, and they're, I think, working on trying to pull up this place map. Uh, you've heard now a little history, uh, what we're currently engaged in the facility, kind of an overview of the regulatory framework that we live in. Um, we're currently working on, as we've told you before, the board recommendation, reducing the risk of the facility, uh, and uh, moving towards putting it in a deactivated state. Uh, so some, at the conclusion of that deactivation, is that me? 
the, the, current, the current schedule would then have the building sit there until 2036-ish, somewhere down, out into the future a ways. Um, we believe, and what we would like to go do, is to pursue an approach where at the point that deactivation is completed, almost like the next day, decommissioning starts and they proceed all the way to the end state immediately instead of having it sit there kicking the can down the road for 15 years or so. Um, we currently spend uh, seven million-ish a year on surveillance and maintenance of the facility. Uh, when we get it to a deactivated state, that number will be reduced. A, a guesstimate might be four to five million dollar range, but that cost will occur every year until 2036 or whatever and escalate into whatever dollars it turns into. So it makes good, in Randy's view, it makes good business sense to go ahead and just get it done. Um, so this here would be the deactivated part that we've talked about. This would be the decommissioning piece, as I've said before. In order to support a seamless transition at this point where deactivation starts and you'd want to start the field work of facility decommissioning, you have to start the engineering and the regulatory work and all the document preparation that has to occur before that almost now. So our desire would be to start this regulatory work, and our plan is to start this regulatory work and document preparation and engineering that would have to be done to support decommissioning occurring right at about the same time deactivation completes. If you will, there will be activities going on in parallel. The deactivation work will be conducted in the building. Uh, the engineering and kind of the paperwork, if you will, the document preparation and everything else uh, for the decommissioning uh, would be done in parallel with that so that that would be concluded right at the point where they could start actually working in the building when the deactivation is done. Um, there are advantages to that in addition to the monetary ones. I mean, we currently have uh, a level of expertise and knowledge of the building, the engineering, the systems, structures, components, that kind of stuff. We have a, a trained workforce that's gain, gained and is still gaining a lot of experience working in there with this material. Um, if we were to kick the can down the road, uh, you could probably retrain people. You're going to have to go find them. You have to retrain them. That's going to take time and money. The institutional knowledge that you might lose, uh, I don't know the extent to which you could recover that. You obviously could recover some of it. You're going to have to go back and dig through records and everything else. But there, there's a lot of advantages to just continuing forward uh, and getting the building done. We believe, and it's a guesstimate at this point because we're just in the be very beginning stages of starting to lay out a schedule for the decommissioning work. And once that schedule is laid out and detailed, we'll be able to come up with a uh, cost estimate uh, of sorts, at least a beginning one. Uh, but we believe right now that if we started today with that work and we're ready at the handoff of deactivation to proceed directly with the decommissioning work, we might be done in an additional three to four years, and it would just be done. Uh, the, the plutonium would be stabilized, it'd be isolated, uh, the building would be placed in a safe, basically a safe configuration for its duration. Um, so what we would, and, and we have held uh, that decommissioning, getting to the decommission state, uh, as Brian has said, uh, our desire would be to go through a removal action uh, in the circular process and, and an ECA and a, a decision, is it a decision memo or an action memo? Action memorandum. Action memorandum. Um, would, would be to go through that process, but that has to be negotiated with the regulators, the EPA and state. Um, we, held, we have had one, what I would call a, an extremely preliminary meeting, just to kind of talk about this is the building, these are the hazards that are in there, this is kind of what we would like to do. Uh, but our desired outcome, obviously, is something that have to be negotiated with uh, EPA uh, and DHEC. Uh, but that's at least our wish and what we would like to go do. Uh, what we would appreciate from the CAB uh, is your opinion on our approach and our desired uh, path forward. Agree, disagree, you know, does, 
We believe that it makes sense to go ahead and leverage the assets, the resources, and everything we have in place and just proceed all the way to the end state. Um, and that's the path that we're currently on uh, and working towards. Uh, and we'd be interested in you know, your opinions relative to what we're planning to do. So, questions? Not yet. Oh, Let's do not yet. <laughs> Gil, I know you want to make a short announcement and then let I'm going to let you do that, and then let's take maybe a 10-minute break real quick. Yeah, we've been sitting, we've been here getting a ton of information for about two and a half hours. Let's take a quick 10-minute uh, break. I um, want to thank the Administrative and Outreach Committee for organizing with Greg and Joyce, getting some donuts and coffee for the CAB members. If we can all just meet over there, uh, have a quick little, quick little discussion, uh, just more of a social thing, it'd be great. But I don't want to take any more of the, up any more of the break time. So let's break, come back, and hopefully we have some great questions. Thanks. So let's do 10 minutes. And I know some of you won't be able to help yourselves. You're probably going to approach a panel member and ask a question. I'm going to ask that you try and refrain. Let's get the questions in the public. All right.
Let's bring it in. Find our seats. I think I understand that. I'll sit for you guys. I'll we'll sit for now. Let's see who jumps first. Yeah. Hey, you got questions right off the bat, don't you, Rob? <laughs> you are ready to go. Yes, <laughs> sir. Statement. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Let's find our seats and let's get started again. Before we hop into Q&A, I know Michael Michelinus wanted to say a few words to kind of wrap things up from his perspective. Uh, he won't, he'll go pretty quick and then we'll launch into the Q&A time. So thank you, James. Mike Michelinus, Department of Energy. I want to step outside my role as the DDF, one of the co-DDFOs for a minute and kind of synthesize what you've heard. I, I really want to thank the speakers for taking the time for, to put this material together and to come meet with you and, and discuss it. But I, I want to kind of pull the whole, the whole topic that we're <clears throat> asking you to focus upon together in about two minutes. So about two years ago, and to use what you got up here, this is where we are kind of now. So back around here, we were preparing to go in and clean up these cells <clears throat> in 235F because of it, the defense board had pointed out that the facility represented a hazard to co-located workers should a fire occur and mobilize the, the waste. <clears throat> and our goal was to pull enough plutonium out and clean up the building so that we could continue to leave the building status quo until F area was cleaned up in 2036 or 40 or something like that and deal with it as the area. But we learned a couple things as we've <clears throat> cleaned the material up, specifically, we thought, and the whole reason the board wrote the recommendation was that the, the, this plutonium that was ball milled was, was extremely small particle size, easily dispersed or moved around. And that's why the board was concerned that a fire could loft that into the air, downwind to the workers, and could cause a risk. <clears throat> well, that equates to it ought to be pretty easy to sweep it up, duct tape it, et cetera, get these things in the bags and remove it from the cells. And our goal was to remove about 90% of the material that was in those cells. But as we've started to clean out cell one and cell two and the wing cabinet out behind cell one, we're not getting that much material out. That either means the material is um, plated out and, and fixed, not dispersible to the floor and the walls or, or inside large pieces of equipment like the furnace and the ball mill itself. <clears throat> so this material is not, what we're learning is, hey, the material's not as dispersible as we thought or, or movable as we thought, and it's gonna be a whole lot harder to remove 90% of the material to <clears throat> leave business as usual. So the department and SRNS recognized that a change in direction was appropriate, and considering this administration's focus on trying to accelerate closure, accelerate risk reduction, we saw this as an opportunity to say, hey, let's go change the status quo. Let's not necessarily wait till 2040 to do something about this. What could I do now knowing what I have in the building? So there's two points of consideration in the, as Randy said, the get her done approach. <clears throat> First, we have to demonstrate that fires are not capable of reaching and dispersing the plutonium waste within the building. Should we do something different? And SRNS is pretty close. They're made a lot of progress into, doing, into putting together something on paper that documents all the work to remove the, the transient combustibles like cabinets and lunch rooms and tables and chairs and, and even walls within the building that now you don't have a, the potential for a fire to reach that, the soft, chewy material at risk inside these hot cells and disperse it. So I can make the defense board consider, concerns possibly go away right now given that it's not dispersible and, and the fires don't, uh, are not likely to reach it, but we still have to document that. So if we make the defense board issue go away, the other then point of consideration is what do we do under CERCLA? We need to then evaluate how much plutonium needs to be removed before DOE could demonstrate to the regulators, in this case EPA and the South Carolina Department of, uh, of, of Environmental Control, 
how, how much do we need to remove before it's safe to entomb the material as it is, or do we have to remove so much that we have to actually disassemble the building, the, the kind of demolish and remove as Brian was talking to? So the standard we're using to evaluate that to is essentially drinking water standards. In whether in five to 20,000 years, if we, whatever material is left after the circular process that Brian walked you through, that that material that we leave behind in, in, in way, way in the future, the goal that we have is that we, we generally start at the drinking water standards that in five or 20,000 years when this stuff starts to migrate and come out in the surface waters that it'd be so dispersed and diffused and, and decayed away that you could actually put in a glass of water and drink it and meet the drinking water standards today. <laughs> Um, that's the beginning part, hopefully, you know, but we'll have to actually see what the analysis shows to us. So that puts the department in a position of weighing, weighing some important risk. We have, on one hand, we've got the risk to the workers of continuing to stick their hands in the gloves that, that Jeff showed you earlier and sweeping up the material and cleaning it out of the hot cells. And, and not just the, that's just with the, 235F cell removal, but even in the de deactivation and decontamination, if we're to go cut down buildings, the, the risk to the worker is one inhalation, and we put them in air hoods and things like that, but the other big concern that doesn't come across in some of these things, the, the biggest risk to the workers is as they're cleaning out those hot cells that they'll get hit something sharp that'll puncture through these gloves. That's why we've got armored gloves and the surgical gloves and layers and layers and layers on top to minimize that potential from happening. And oh, by the way, using tools so that the workers don't even stick their hands in the powder. But that risk is there inherently with the cleanup. And if you poke through and, and, and actually cut yourself with some plutonium in there, it's, it's worse than actually inhaling it because usually when you inhale it, it gets stuck in your lungs and then works from the lungs into the bloodstream and that's where the biological effects happen, which is really lung cancer, liver cancer, and bone cancer and destroying the bone marrow. But you inject it, you bypass the lungs, you put it right into the blood where it can get to the liver and get to the bone very, very quickly. So we, it, I have to balance, we have to balance that as an agency, the risk of that, to the other risk of, okay, how much material do we leave in, so that in five or 20,000 years, how much environmental risk are we willing to accept in the future as a trade-off against worker risk today. We haven't made a decision on that, but part of that is what the EPA, DHEC, and DOE are going to evaluate and discuss and consider as they go through the circular process. That'll be a public, the public will be invited to look at the results of those deliberations, but we'll weigh those risks. What I really would like you guys to do and appreciate today is We've got the experts here to go ask some of these kinds of questions. I'd also like you to go, we've got a mock-up in there. Jeff's got the gloves. Put these things on. Get an appreciation of what a worker has to go through and how the tactile dexterity is affected by doing this kind of work. And, and that, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a risk. They are well-trained. I'm not trying to, trying to get anybody concerned that, oh, geez, we're putting our workers at undue risk. We're not. But that, that the possibility exists that something could happen, even with all these controls. I'd like you to understand how hard it is for the workers to go do what they're doing the way we've got them protected, so that you can appreciate a little bit some of what we, the DOE managers, are, are considering as we decide, well, geez, do I keep removing and try to get that other get to 90% of the material removed or maybe take the whole building down and throw it in a dump or, 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 or do I avoid some of these risks? So I'd, I'd, I'd really like you to keep this point in mind because that's what's in our head. That's what we're looking at you to, I'm, I'm asking you to evaluate and give us some of your recommendations and some thoughts on should we continue to put the workers at risk or how important is, is the worker risk as opposed to the environmental risk in the future to you as a public, as a layman, not as a scientist or an engineer. And with that, James, thank you for giving me a chance to summarize this. James. Yeah, um, on our agenda, we've just heard of him two and a half hours of very, very complicated, very important information. This, on our agenda, it leaves us 15 minutes to discuss two and a half hours. That's not acceptable. 
Um, so we are going to push, so just so if we're sitting here looking at the agenda and realize we're leaving at 11, we're going to push to at least 1130. Uh, to give you a heads up, uh, the IPL portion of the agenda will be removed. Well, we'll have to vote on that, but it will be, it is okay to do the IPL in May, so we do have some time. So just in case someone's getting antsy and sees that it's 11 o'clock, we are going to push to at least 1130. So I hope that's okay with everybody. All right. So don't feel under the gun for 15 minutes. Uh, I know that we do have lots of cab members, lots of questions. Rob, I know you wanted to give a brief statement from an EPA perspective before we travel down the road. Yeah, I would like that. Thank you. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Rob Pope. Um, I was the FFA manager for Savannah River site for a number of years. Um, uh, got pulled away a couple of years ago to work on a site in uh, our Kansas City region. Um, but I'm, I'm back in the region full time and I'm actually the acting section chief over all the DOE sites in the region, which includes Oak Ridge and Paducah right now. Um, and uh, 235F has been on our radar for quite some time. Uh, uh, really early on when DNFSB mentioned it in one of their reports and, and DOE had talked to us about it before then even as part of F area. So uh, we followed it for some time and, and had the same concerns I think the community in the cab and DNFSB has had in the past. Um, but it's not, has not been in our purview, not really in our world. As long as they're doing deactivation, it's really a nuclear materials problem and not, a, not yet a uh, circular EPA problem. Um, but of course, we have been concerned about it, the possible risk if something happened beyond the fence line as well as the risk to the workers that exist on, you know, for that building. Um, and I, I just want to touch on a couple of things. Brian mentioned that there is a 1995 joint policy between EPA and the Department of Energy. And that policy is all about decommissioning buildings. And it very clearly states that buildings shall be de decommissioned, if appropriate, under the CERCLA, what we call removal action, non-time critical removal action process, which is one of the processes Brian laid out. Um, that is EPA's preferred method for this facility. Uh, we have gone down the remedial action pathway, which takes more time and more planning and uh, allows for public comment as well. But for this building in particular, because of the risk it represents, because of the worker risk, which Michael has told you about and, and uh, Randy told you about, we are interested in seeing it addressed as quickly as possible. Um, so, and then a couple of other things is we have been very lucky at Savannah River Site to take advantage of opportunities when they have been offered. Uh, I look at the work that was done at P Reactor and R Reactor as a clear example of that, where we were working down the road on P Reactor of trying to come to a final decision there, and Recovery Act was passed, and a large amount of funding was suddenly available to the department to take advantage of and because we were well placed we were ready to jump right on it and move forward with P reactor and we got our reactor as a bonus um, out of recovery act so I'm a firm believer of when you get an advantage take up take that opportunity as soon as possible um, we have heard that there's a lot of interest in DOE headquarters about addressing 235 F so if that holds true we certainly want to move down that pathway as quickly as possible, just as I know Department of Energy does. And then the other idea of going down a, a record of decision, a proposed plan with this particular building is it's just one little piece, even though it's a big and important building, it's one little piece of what we call F area at the site. And the rest of the area is not ripe for us to make a decision on. We don't have the information about F Canyon it's really some time away. I think the, the date you were showing, Brian, was 1939, uh, 2040, 2040, right? Um, before we get to F Canyon and F area. And there are a number of buildings still up in F area that we don't have much information about yet. So we think it's premature to try and go down that record of decision route, but it's very timely to go down the non-time critical removal action route. Um, and other than that, I think some of the things that I was going to talk about, Michael already stole my thunder, so I'm not going to add to those. Um, but I just wanted to give you the EPA perspective that we're interested in moving forward as quickly as possible on this building. And what DOE has brought to us uh, most recently looks very promising and something that we support. All right, cab members, y'all ready?
Let's go. I'm going to start on my left with Jim. Uh, Jim Giel, Cap. Uh, looking ahead on the accelerated uh, project for decommissioning 235, is what is the impact on your funding requests? Do you have enough money currently? Do you need to be asking for a special additions? As I said, we, we are currently on a path to deactivate the facility, um, and I'm optimistic we're going to be able to figure out how to get that done. The funding for the decommissioning, um, we don't really have a really good number yet. That's why I said that the, it's essential that the planning begin right now so they can start to lay out the schedule for the activities, uh, and then that can be basically man-loaded, and they can come up with a pretty reliable estimate. There are numbers out there right now. Uh, they're big numbers, and they're based on a lot of assumptions about what might have to be done or how it might have to be done um, that may not hold true when we lay out the plan for how we're going to go do this. Um, so we don't have a good number today uh, for the decommissioning piece of it, uh, but I know Chris and uh, the SRNS folks are working diligently to come up with that because we're going to need to feed that into the budget process going forward uh, pretty soon. So, Mike Michelais, Jim, just to address that, to extend Randy's remarks a little bit, we're at a decision point where now that we finished the work in cell one and, and I believe cell two and we were, we've taken some additional readings, we're approaching a point where we can, we can make a decision to suspend the removal of the material. I have budget put aside in, in this fiscal year as well as a little bit in the next fiscal year to finish up the implementation plan actions that we committed to the defense board. If we were to suspend that now or in the near future, <clears throat> that would preserve a few million dollars that would have otherwise gone to cleaning that now we can retarget toward putting together the deactivation plan, making some actions happen in the facilities. And in the meantime, we're going to be looking at the 20 appropriation, which went to the Hill to see whether there's, there's some options to move it within buckets that we have to be able to continue to move forward with this. So no, we don't have the funding defined and in place yet, but part of that's because we don't have the deactivation plan and all that laid out in de sufficient detail to start saying, here's how much money I need at these certain points of time, but we're working toward that. That's why it's the right time to engage you because we haven't put so much time into it that the plans are all final and you'd have no impact on it. Okay, thank you. Dan? Uh, Dan kaminsky Cap. I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll take one group and pass it along for conversation. Um, mostly about uh, worker exposure. Uh, what's the current limit of exposure for a worker at SRS? Is it 100 it's milligrams per 250 year? Milligrams per year. 250 milligrams per year. 15 milligrams? 250 milligrams per year. 250 milligrams per year. Okay, and uh, so the exposure rate was close to uh, three rem per hour? That is the contact rate on some of the waste we've been pulling out. That is not the whole worker, whole worker exposure. They're not receptive. That is the rate on the stuff we're pulling out of the cell. So the whole body exposure is much less than that. Okay. So um, with that being said, obviously you've probably done the math on what limitations they'd have for how many hours of exposure per year. Does that all fit with the size of the team? and their capacity to perform such work in that limited amount of time? It's a challenge. We're looking at it very closely. We do have a way we can, we can ask for an extension to the site limit, the 250 milligram limit. We're evaluating that now. A lot of it will depend on how far we go in the process. As, as Mr. Uh, Michael just mentioned to us, if we stop at cell two, then if stop near term, then you know, I got half the year I'm not, I'm not exposing people to the, to the material. So. Uh, we are watching that very closely. We will uh, potentially ask for an extension to, to our ACL um, based on the exposure. Um, but to date, we're still below 250 milligram. We have no one approaching that at this time. And what is uh, the contingency plan should a member or members of the, the team, I don't know exactly the size, but it looked relatively small in the video. Uh, what's the contingency plan should one of those workers be exposed and could no longer function in the capacity of the team? If they reach our limit, we could not extend them any longer than we would put them in a, in a position where they would not be exposed any more. Right now we do have six operators who go in routinely to work. Um, 
we have other people in training that we could potentially bring in. Uh, the training is a long process. Obviously, we want to make sure they're fully trained and ready to go in and do that type of work. Uh, the PPE, the, the dose rates they're being exposed to is high, but the PPE is working extraordinarily well. The lead aprons, the borated gloves, uh, um, you know, so the PPE is doing a very good job protecting them. And again, we are monitoring them um, daily on what their exposure is. Would there be any benefit of like a lead apron curtain to draw on that wall so that there are only limited exposure ports? We've evaluated that. Um, that really limits your access to getting your arms in the gloves with that lead apron, plus your visibility is reduced even more. So we, we do wear the apron. Um, you, using a, a curtain just did not pr prove to be beneficial to us. Okay, thank you. Bob? Bob Smith here. Uh, this is kind of complicated, but from the presentation, it seems that you remove that cells one and two contain 90% of the uh, PU-238. You've removed 75 grams in 150 waste cuts from that facility, and 436 grams was remaining in cells one and two in the cabinets, wing cabinets. Do we know exactly how much total PU-238 we're talking about in all of the cells, and if we are not able to remove it as uh, Michael was saying, or re remove it if it's in a different form than in the small particulate, uh, what, what's the, the remedy of that? I mean, where, where, where is the material and can we identify where the material is? So, so what form? So we have done a number of assays over the years. Some of them are dated at this point uh, and were done with older types of equipment. Uh, so we've redone some of the assays in the PUFF facility with newer equipment and they've given us more precise results with smaller error bands uh, and the numbers have been uh, smaller uh, than the old numbers that we had. Um, having said that, um, Jeff has learned uh, when they go in and work, while they have 70 some grams that they've removed so far, uh, during some preliminary work that they did, because they're bringing out big chunks of things, during some preliminary work, they went in and took a wipe and just wiped the floor and removed a gram or so. They, they removed a gram just with that. So it seems to us like what we're bringing out now is a lot of the rust. And when they get to the point of vac get the big things out of the way and start vacuuming and wiping down the cells, uh, they'll start to bring out a lot more material with that effort. Um, if we don't get to where we need to be in the removal, um, then we'll have to look at that. When he believes he's done what he can do, we'll have SRNL go in and do another assay. So we'll be comparing apples to apples with the old one, uh, and we'll have to look at what is left in there, uh, and that'll have to be part of our decision process of do we need to do anything in addition to that, or is what we have done good enough given the risk to the workers that it would entail by doing more. And that's all part of the discussion that we would have to have with the regulators uh, over this is what we have and this is what we would like to do with it. What do you think? Thank you. Bobby? Bobby Williams, CAP. Um, is this a 24-hour operation? No, no, this is a, a daytime only operation. And you said you have six trained operators? That's correct. We have six technicians, and we also have six uh, RAGCON personnel also who okay. perform monitoring. And the workforce, are they, I saw some of the people in that uh, video that look like they are at retirement age. So do you? <laughs> A couple of them would beg to differ, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and have you had so you're training younger workers to? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And have you had any puncture wounds since this work started? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Dave. Dave Eisenkamp. Uh, I believe this question is for you, Jeff. 
if I heard you correctly, you said you were uh, the, the fan house is in operation, and it's some you will remediate, remove as much mar as you can, then you will apply the fixative. And I thought I heard you say the fans will stay on. Uh, will you turn it over to closure with those fans still operating? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it, it, at what point, do, well, if he's going to turn the fans off, at some point, you, the fans have got to be turned off when you seal up the building. How do, how do you monitor whether the fixative is working the way it's supposed to if, you can't, if you're not drawing a vacuum on the, um, on the building? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. It's Jack Musall, SRNS. Um, obviously, we're going to deactivate the building and we're going to go cold and dark. And what that means is the building itself uh, has no electrical service to it. Uh, no, there'll be no ignition sources within it. And that'll help prevent the fire from occurring moving forward. Now, the fan house that uh, provides the vacuum to the building will remain operational. And that'll continue through deactivation and it'll continue into decommissioning. So uh, there's a lot of details that still have to be determined uh, with respect to decommissioning, um, what's the final configuration of the building. Um, that'll set the stage for, to get to that final configuration, we have to do certain things like, you know, seal entrances. We might have to graft, uh, I'm sorry, grout certain parts of the building. We may need to demolition parts of the building. That'll all dictate if and when the fans get turned off. But there'll have to be a plan. Uh, the, the, uh, the plan for the exhaust will have to complement and support the, actually, the actual decommissioning steps, which are to be determined. We don't know at this point. Dave, the, re the remaining fan is in a separate building from 235, so we can de-energize 235 I, I, I and still keep it's that. The, it's the vacuum. What you're saying is you don't know how are you going to seal it up and turn the fans off? Or it has to be determined. To be, yeah, the timing for it. But obviously, the fans would remain running as long as we are during the decommissioning process. As long as there's the potential for the stuff to become dispersed. I mean, once it's you've grouted the spaces that contain the contaminant, then obviously you can turn the ventilation off that service those areas. So there'll be a step, a stepwise. Uh, turning off or reconfiguration of the ventilation during the decommissioning. So, Mike Michelance, do we, Dave, let me, let me put an answer to your question in English for the rest of the cab as well. I know you've got a technical background. So, the, an the short answer to your question is, how are we, we don't know when we'll turn those fans off. That'll be part of the negotiations during the circular process that Brian talked about. And, and further, we're not going to put any fixative or any grout. We would like to grout and entomb whatever material we can't, we decide is not feasible to remove. We'd like to entomb that within the hot cells or the facility, but we can't do a single action of putting in that fixative or putting any grout in there until we go through the circular process where the regulators say, hey, we agree with that end state. It's okay to move forward because we can't do anything that's irreversible. So all of the question you ask will be, will be evaluated and considered as part of the circular process and looking at the risks and, and, and so on with it. But I have not a concern in my mind, and not a doubt in my mind, if we decide to grout it, or even if we use this, this fire dam thermal barrier, that fixative that we've got there, that it'll hold the material in place. And the issue of whether we keep it under negative pressure following decommissioning or or at what point in the decommissioning process it would come out, that, that's more of a tactical decision once the circular process is, the, is done. Fair enough. Thank you. Michael, I, Michael, I appreciate this is Gil Cap. Michael, I appreciate that explanation. And just one thing is when we start getting into these discussions about specifics like a fan and things like that, that we're here to, here to give advice and how to move forward. We're not here to talk about techni technicalities. Of course, we want to know about health and worker and employee safety. But when we start talking about grout versus what, what you're over my head, but you know, th we just have to be careful as a cab. We don't go into that level because we're not here as telling them how to do their job. Because Dave, I know you have that knowledge and there's some, we've had people in the past, but that's a little bit beyond our scope. So I just want to be clear on that. Thanks. Charles. Charles Hilton Cab. In spite of our chairman's admonition, I still have some questions. Uh, 
I still didn't get a clear, as a follow-up to Bob's question, I didn't get a clear answer on how much material is actually in 235. I thought I heard in the presentation there was 16, 1700 grams. On this thing it says 560 grams. How much material is, are we dealing with? Uh, this is Jack Musil again, SRNS. Uh, original assays for the building is roughly 1600 grams. And that's really what, of is, what is of record in our safety analysis, our safety basis for the building. Now we've since gone back and we've done additional assays using better techniques, more extensive uh, readings, um, better equipment, and our current estimate is approximately 600 grams is what we believe is in the building. And that's, up, go ahead. Of that 600 grams, we said 436 grams are in one and two, of which you've gotten rid of 90, leaving 346 grams, if my math is quick. That, that sounds Roughly. correct, yes. All right, the goal from other comments is to get rid of 90% of it. That is, yeah, that is no longer the, the goal in the building. Um, Obviously, we want, to, we want to close the DNFSB recommendation, which is um, if a fire was to occur, a seismically induced fire was to occur, um, the amount of material in the building that is released and then of the MAR. Um, we've since decided that, or we've since come to the realization that we don't really need to remove that much MAR. We, could, uh, we just need to remove enough MAR to support whatever is decided during the CERCLA process to decommission the building, which right now is roughly 50 percent. It could become a smaller percentage. Um, but the goal is, originally was to remove 90 percent to close the DNFSB recommendation. Uh, we think we don't need to do that anymore. There's uh, some factors in the uh, safety analysis or the accident analysis associated with the building which would get us from to 100 rem without removing that much more. Because there's different factors that, that go into the calculation. Um, so we're hoping to, uh, or the plan is to close the DNFSB recommendation and remove much less more, in summary. So Mike Michelias, do we, Charles, just to extend some of what, what Jack was saying. The, uh, since, since we've learned that the material is not as dispersible or removable as we once thought, we've shifted from looking at trying to get 90% or so, and that's a figure I use, not what our commitment was to the defense board. Um, getting that much material out of the facility, but rather now one to how much do I need to remove to be able to have a high likelihood of success of demonstrating that we can meet the drinking water standards at when, when these contaminants would peak out in the environment. And we've done some preliminary analysis, and I don't think any of the speakers have gotten into this one, but we've done some preliminary back of the envelope analysis from a formal analysis that was done years ago, and we believe that as Jack said, maybe half or less of the remaining mar in the facility needed to come out, and we've removed 90, 90 grams of that so far. So we're getting pretty close to the point where maybe I've removed enough that I could go do that analysis, demonstrate that when these contaminants peak in the environment in five to 20,000 years, that I'm at the drinking water standards. And, and that, that might be an acceptable level of risk to the regulator. So we don't know how much material we'll leave back in place. It's going to be a matter of looking at how much is there, how easy it is to remove it, and then it'll be a discussion of relative risk with the regulators as to how, how much do we leave behind versus the worker risk versus a number of other considerations that they'll, they'll, <clears throat> take in the, that they'll discuss with us. Does that help a little bit? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, James, if I may, I'd like to mention something, too, in response to that question. Sure, uh, without, th this won't be highly technical, but ha it has to do with the hazard. Um, as you know, the half-life of plutonium-238 is a little less than 90 years, 88 or so years. The modeling that we're talking about that shows uh, the amount of plutonium that, that can be left in the building without exceeding and I'm talking about in millennia, in thousands of years, a drinking water standard. The drinking water standard is not exceeded by plutonium-238. It's long gone. It's long have decayed into other things. So what actually would exceed that drinking water standard would be some decay product. It's actually an isotope of lead, I believe, isn't it, Michael? Radium? <clears throat> Mike McLean's DOE. It's actually 
lead, you would exceed the lead and and the alpha emitters that are the two that, that are two standards that we'd be looking at. Right. So radium the immediate, is the alpha emitter that we'd be concerned with. The immediate hazard to people is from plutonium two thirty eight, but um, plutonium two thirty eight that's that's encased in grout isn't a hazard to anybody. At that point, it becomes this long term risk of as I said, after thousands of years, after the model uh, shows that the, the grout is no longer containing the material and it has decayed into something and gotten it, made its way into the soil, eventually to the water table, and then you start comparing it to, to um, groundwater protection standards, the exceedance is way, way out there. I want to say tens of thousands of years. And so Brian, long, Brian long, is now long after plutonium is gone and the hazard of plutonium is gone. Brian is now practicing our pitch to the EPA in DHEC. <laughs> Thank you. Narendra Malik Cab, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Mike, I have a couple of questions and I start with the circular modeling. Does it tell you how low you can achieve it cost effectively with the removal of plutonium from the building? Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, I'm not sure I understood. I... Just repeat it, please. How low you can remove I mean, the activity, uh, radioactivity from plutonium in the building? Are, are you asking, do we know how low we plan to go as far with, as... With the, will the circular model tell you that? No. Uh, no, I, I, I believe it. I believe, and Chris and Brian can correct me, that the, that that model that they use is a model that models transport of the material from where it lives today all the way through to the groundwater, and uh, you feed into it where you start, and then uh, they run a lot of iterations of the calculation, and it ends up with an answer 10,000, 5,000, a lot of years down the road, but it, it it doesn't tell you how low you have to go. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is to uh, reduce it as low as practical, um, understanding that modeling. And we did run, a model was run seven years ago based on that preliminary assay that was done, which we now know was extremely conservative and the amount of plutonium is actually far less. But the model predicted back in 2012 that that estimate, the estimated uh, quantity of plutonium-238, if it were reduced by 60 percent, would be protective of these, of these groundwater limits. Now, we know that the amount is far less, but we haven't, we don't have a final inventory and we haven't modeled it, of course. So, so the, just for perspective. We asked the lab to take the previous model that they had done use the newer assay numbers that we have and do not a full-blown model, but a rough approximation run and let us know where that would put us. And that put us in the range of, it was a little less than 50%, but basically if we can reduce that uh, level of MAR in cells one and two by about half, then we should be okay. But like I said, that was a really rough model, and we'll have to reduce it, do a full-blown assay, and then run the whole model and see what it tells us. My other question is, uh, since the deactivation has started, so we know what kind of materials and, uh, have to be removed, so are you planning to start ECA and RIF simultaneously? ECA and RIF. What we would like to do uh, is continue forward with our deactivation work that we're doing, uh, but also have the decommissioning paperwork uh, and regulatory documentation started because there's going to be a lot of engineering work that's going to have to be done as a part of that so that that can be proceeding in parallel mm -hmm. with the deactivation work that we're doing to kind of set us up that we can, at the conclusion of deactivation, be in a position and have all the documentation approved and agreed with uh, that we can proceed with the physical work in the building that, we, that would need to be done to continue forward with decommissioning. One, one caveat, we can't really 
finish, we can't finish the ECA until we have a final inventory quantity and the modeling results using that quantity. Once you finish ECA, then you will start the remedial action master plan. Start the re remedial action, did you say? Yes. Uh, after the ECA has been uh, looked at by EPA and DHEC, and, th and they concur that it's suitable to go to the public for review, we would uh, receive and consider public comments um, and eventually issue an action memorandum that, th that describes the remedial action. There wouldn't be a, uh, so the, in, under removal, there would be an action memorandum. There wouldn't be a broad uh, a record of decision. I hope I'm answering your question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Greg? Thank you guys, Greg Murray. Um, thanks for coming and giving us uh, an update and spending some time with us today. Let me, I, I, the way it's been described is there's significant cost to doing this, this project. What, what are the opportunity costs for doing it? If we, do, if we don't do this project, what projects are we passing up on doing? You mean if we do this project? No, if you, if you don't do this accelerated project, which, which it sounds like is going to cost extra money, what would that money go towards? What would those resources go towards? What are we not doing instead if we do this? Oh, what are we not doing? I guess I don't have a good answer for that. When we, we plan to proceed through with deactivation uh, for the defense. We need to achieve closure on the board's recommendation. We've already committed to do that. The decommissioning part of that, mm -hmm. uh, those budget discussions uh, haven't begun yet. I mean, it should start any day uh, with discussions on the 21 budget, uh, but that will be the point where those decisions will have to be made and, and talked about. So, DOE, Mike Michelinos. So, so the things that wouldn't get done, it, it's, Really, I can only answer that question in the context of the next couple of years because that's what we've got budget for. What's not gonna get done is that we would be stopping the work to go continue removing from the cells and instead applying that money that would have been used to clean out cells three, four, five and do some of the, and change the, the, the DSA for the facility, the documented safety analysis. We would suspend all of that work and use that resources instead to go do the um, to go do this uh, this deactivation. So if we chose not to do the deactivation, then we would mindlessly continue to drone on through the rest of the cells, change the DSA paperwork, and execute the the def the secretary's implementation plan to the to, to the defense board. But as I said earlier, that I would be putting workers at risk to continue putting their hands in there where the where the hazards are. Mm -hmm. And, and incurring the likelihood of either to getting a snootful if we were to rip one of the gloves or to puncture a worker. I, I don't believe those risks are high given the protections and the actions that Jeff and his crew have taken, um, but those are the things that we would worry about. And out in the out years as opposed to decommissioning and actually d and ding the facility, well, I, I'm expecting that we'll have to get some additional resources here to the site, but that's beyond the current uh, <clears throat> budgeting cycle and we would be putting that the amount of money that we need into a request where that would come from within the EM complex is really not something I could even speculate upon right now so uh, one more thing in the soil and groundwater or the area completion program we have our plans for the next five years we already have them they're based on the commitments that we have in appendix E of the FFA and as of today we don't have any plan to deviate from those okay. so as Michael just said I think what we're talking about is probably some additional or new resources to to make this accelerated decommissioning possible or you know um, and any changes to our appendix e commitments we would have to be negotiated with EPA and, and uh, South Carolina DHEC okay thank you yeah Rob Pope okay. EPA I just wanted to, to add to that that when DOE came to us to talk to us about this they didn't say anything to us about slowing up any work on any other project. Like Brian was saying, they have their plan in place. We've approved it um, for this year and the outcoming two years. And they didn't say anything about slowing anything else down. So it is, it is EPA's assumption and I think DHEC's assumption that they will find the additional funding to do this. Not that any project we're working on, whether it's high level waste tanks 
or coal ash, run the spectrum will be stopped or slowed down in any way. So this would be up to DOE to go find that extra money. And, and like I mentioned, EPA has heard that there's interest in doing this all the way up to at least EM1, which is um, their assistant secretary level. So for us, we think that's a, a, a great bonus project, we'll call it, um, if nothing else is going to be impacted, and that's how we're approaching it. And, and Mike McElhinney's DOE, last point. You, you see from the placement up there, there's a lot of actions in parallel. Well, what you don't see there, because it's a level of granularity much finer than what's up there, before the department makes a, a, an enforceable commitment to, to EPA and the state, which would be essentially to put this, in, this as a milestone within the federal, the FFA, um, there will be, we'll be teeing this up to EM1, there will be budgetary considerations and deter decisions made on her part um, long before we start making enforceable milestones to the, to the EPA and state. But my goal is to drive those discussions at headquarters with EM1 to get them into Appendix C so that future administrations, it, it, it doesn't get undone. So the sooner we get a plan with costs and an integrated schedule, up to EM1, and that's why we're driving this quickly through the cab as well, because we want your input in it. The sooner I get that done, the sooner I can have those discussions with EM1, the sooner I can have an idea of what am I going to have to request in the 21, 22, 23, 24 fiscal year budgets. And, and if I get her buy-in on it now, saying, yep, okay, these costs are low enough for decommissioning that I want to continue to go down through these things, this will be something that will be preserved then through an administration change in the future. Okay. So, so there are, bottom line is there are opportunity costs. We just don't know if they're going to be here or someplace else. If you're saying EM1 is right. going to make a, going to prioritize the budget, she will be deciding the priorities and she will be recognizing the opportunity costs. We won't. Is that? Trust me, the, the assistant secretary will not let the site make new commitments to the to the state or the public without reviewing and understanding what we're proposing to commit to and making sure that the department has the ability to fund and meet those. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then one other question. We've, we've talked a lot about risks to the operators. Um, I'm assuming we have lots of, of uh, experience with our operators working in gloves and in situations like this. What's the probability of one of these puncture wounds? So Mike McElhinney's do we it's actually occurred, not on this project, but uh, I forget when, what, what was the year for that? Uh, Transuranic waste characterization. Right, back about around 2012, 2010, somewhere in that time frame while we were repackaging transuranic waste, um, and that's where you open up drums and you start to remove waste out there. One worker did receive a hand puncture yeah. from some sharps in the drum. Um, what Jeff and his, his crew have implemented for this project and integrated and took aboard the lessons learned from that that uh, puncture to try and even further minimize the likelihood of something that happening. But it, it has happened in the past, and it is a real risk that we do everything we can, including multiple layers of gloves, which I, again, here's my pitch. Get out there and take a look at these things and put them on, get a feel for how hard that is. The, what we have to do to protect the workers is makes the work pretty darn cumbersome and which introduces its own inherent danger of making a mistake with all that stuff on. Right. Okay. That, I mean, that makes sense. Can you hear about surgeons cutting themselves all the time with people with infected blood? So it's not Correct. shocking to me that we've had mistakes like that. I was just trying to get an idea of the scale. It, it sounds like the probability is probably really, really low that something like that's going to happen. But the consequences right. are really, really high. Right. Sure. As they are for surgeons who cut themselves with infected blood. So thank you. So let's do a little process check. We have lots of, go ahead and keep your card up, okay? We have lots of cars still up. I know that we originally oh, budgeted an additional 30 minutes. I say that we at least go around the table and get everybody and then break for lunch after that. Um, Is that okay with you folks? I think we need to have a hard timeline uh, or we'll, I mean, I think we're gonna keep going. So let's go to 1145, James. All right. And okay. um, have, I know we have H Cannon starting at 1230. But let's push that back to one o'clock. Yeah, definitely. So we, I do want to have a hard cutoff at 11:45, so we people get at least an hour and 15 minutes. So I appreciate everybody's efforts to answer thoroughly, but let's see if we can truncate just a little bit. All right, Joyce. 
Joyce Underwood Cab. I was going to ask some clarifying questions, but you know what? I can send those in an email. Uh, so I'll ask a simple one. You guys keep talking about 600 grams in the building. In order to help me, a non-science person, conceptualize that, how many grams are in one of those ingots that get hot for the space people? The, 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 the sphere ingot, uh, I believe, was 250 grams. The more recent pellet was, I think it was 150. That's it's right. on one of the slides, but I think it was 150 grams. That is a lot less than I expected you to say. So what you're saying is what's in there now could potentially get really, really hot if it's not secured. No, that, this is Jack no. Musil, SRNS. That's not correct. The, no. uh, even though there is a lot, it sounds like a lot, 600 grams, it's widely dispersed. You can't see it. It takes instruments to detect it, right? You have to see the radiation coming off. So it's not like there's a stockpile of it here or a clump of pile here. It just, throughout the entire uh, puff facility and the, the other two facilities have some uh, gram quantities. Uh, it's just widely dispersed. It's evenly distributed on surfaces. You can't see it. You just can measure it with instruments. Um, it would have to be consolidated into a, like 150 <laughs> grams. Just, yeah, small, small mass or large mass in a small space in order for it to heat. And we don't have any, we, we don't foresee any risk of any self-heating or that we're going to collect any, uh, consolidate too much in one spot where there would be a, a risk of self-heating in a fire. Okay, good. That's good to know. My other question, I don't know if I heard one of the presenters correctly, but I think I heard you say that that NNSA project, which must not be named, is an F area. Is that correct? It is? Okay. So given that information, you're talking about shutting down F area, is that only shutting it down with regard to the EM mission? And that will still be... The reason I'm asking is because you're talking about risk to workers who work in F area, there will still be workers in F area. They just the, won't be our workers. The, the F area operable unit that you heard people talk about that that's an EM thing and closure of that would be EM work if there's to the extent there might be other groups other than EM working in the area if 235 remained there and we didn't do anything about it it's going to represent a hazard to whoever's there right okay well I'll leave it at that for now thank you Betty Betty Cook Cab thank you very much for the time and effort and preparations you put in this panel um, all, most of the questions I have have been even asked and answered, but I have a question. How do you select workers that would be put in this position, and how much training actually go into the normal worker before they put in this area? So when we started the project in 2013, we handpicked our team. Uh, basically, we went back to people who had worked in the re true repacking process 2009 to 2012, and we asked them if they were interested in, in working on this project, and they all volunteered to do so. Uh, so they had a lot of prior experience working with plutonium in a, in a high hazard environment and in glove boxes. Thank you, Randy. Um, so the training, they spent about three years doing training and mock-ups, developing tooling, uh, developing procedures, working with reader worker methods, the headsets on and following instructions uh, before I actually went in and started working hands in gloves. Uh, People are in training right now, They'll, a very similar process. They'll go through them, not quite as long because we've already developed the training now. Um, but before we put people in their hands and their gloves, I mean, we do, they are fully qualified. They fully understand what the hazards are they're working with, how to work with it, uh, what the PPE is, how it works. Uh, we don't, you know, um, just when they complete their training program, we just don't go turn them loose. You know, they work with experienced people. So we're very cautious on who we put in there to go to, do the job. Thank you. I know it's not something you could send them to technical college to learn, so that was my question. No. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Carl Steen, uh, CAB. Um, just a, a, a brief observation or uh, in a way of a question. Um, I know from my own experience, and uh, my brother was a senior staff scientist at IBM, but in any time you put anything off, for 10 years or plan something out for 10 years or 15 years, uh, not many of us are going to really be in these jobs very likely. Maybe we have some younger people here, but you lose so much 
You lose so much that you have all new PhDs, MEs, uh, a new workforce, and they actually would have to start over again. So my comment and question, like how do you prepare for that if you can, but I'm really very much in favor of uh, the decommissioning, deactivation, demolition, remove, remove, uh, removal as quickly as possible. Otherwise, you're going to uh, double the budget and double the time. But that's basically my comment and my life experience. Uh, putting something off 10 or 20 years, you're just going to start over and spend twice, probably three or four times as much. We, we share your view. and. Um when we started this project back in 2013, we actually had a couple of meetings where we went out and tried to find retired operators and people who were here in the 80s actually working in the facility. And that was helpful and we found some, but if we kick the can down the road another 15 years, we're not gonna be able to do that again. Yeah, that was, I, I tried to abbreviate what I said. My brother was called back in. He's 80 years old now, yeah. uh, 81. Uh, he was called back in to help some of the new people understand failure analysis. They knew all the theories, they had a lot of experience, but they didn't know how to do certain things. Uh, a bank called me back in for six months and it turned into si uh, five years, and I'm way beyond retirement age, but I was 30 years older than anybody else anywhere in, in my area. So it, it, we forget about that because we don't want to think about it, but uh, you're going to start all over again if you don't finish up. We agree. Good morning, Doug Howard. Cap, are there any other buildings under the purview of DOE that, that's um, contaminated like 235? There are no other buildings that are contaminated to this level with this isotope. Okay, the question I have then, if, and this is all hypothetical, DOE uh, provided you with everything that you needed, money, a robo robust um, team, and said we want this job done as quickly as possible, how soon could that be done? Could, I mean, could you go quicker than what you're, at the pace that you're going right now? We don't think so. What we put together is our best estimate of when we could realistically and aggressively get it done. And that would have us finishing up deactivation sometime in 22. And if everything started concurrent with that as far as the planning for decommissioning and we were ready to actually start working the building at the end of deactivation, there might be an additional three, maybe four years after that to be at the end state. Okay, so there's nothing else that could help things go much faster? The, the trouble, uh, the short answer is we don't think so. If you get to a point where if you go faster and faster and faster, you run more and more risk of somebody getting hurt. Thank you. I know this, uh, this presentation has been something that's circled and, and you're looking for our recommendation. I'm a little disappointed that we don't have any estimate on the costs. Because, I mean, are we looking to reinvent the wheel here? Because it seems that Hanford's been doing something very similar to this for a while. No, Mike Michelin's DOE. What Hanford did was Hanford d and d the entire building. They, they took the building down to the, they're taking the building down to the foundation. It, I think it's a little bit smaller than the footprint of this one, but what, what we are likely to propose to EPA and the state, and, and it'll be doing the full uh, de demolition and removal is one option that the, that'll be discussed during the circular process, but what we are likely to propose to them is to leave and, and entomb the material if we can demonstrate that the, um, the material, when it does get in the environment, doesn't it wouldn't even exceed uh, drinking water standards in five or 20,000 years. So no, those, the cost of actually doing all that, we don't, we won't, we don't have a, a great idea on that right now. There's no benchmark out there that we could use to say, aha, <coughs> here's what it's like. And these buildings are pretty darn unique, so the costs are gonna be somewhat tailored. So from a cab standpoint, as the Nuclear Materials Committee meets in a four, or five, four or five weeks to talk about 
235 SDs commissioning, I would assume an assumption that I could be wrong about that we're going to be talking about the in our verbiage about finance. And so we're basically going to be talking about giving, you know, a blank check. I, Dewey and Michelance, I'm not as concerned about having, I'm, I'm not as, I don't know that the cab is being asked to focus on the finance aspect of it because you're right. A lot of the finances need to be worked out. I would put that as an assumption that the department will have to work through the funding of whatever EM1 authorizes the, us to go do. Well, we're really, the, 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 the question is the interesting one that I talked about before, which is the trade-off between balancing the worker risk to continue doing this kind of work and even getting into the kinds of D&D that we might have to do. The, the, the prospective worker risk of cutting the building up and, and taking it down versus the, the possible future environmental risk of once the material, the, the building becomes sand, as Brian alluded to, and it does get out into the environment and into the water and everything where it came from. So I think that's what we're really looking for, the cab's thoughts on. Is it better to, I mean, what, what are your thoughts as the public of keep driving, getting all that material out of the building and put into WIP is much more important than the worker risk. I'm, I'm being somewhat flippant with how I pose the questions, but those are the kinds of questions we'd like you to go discuss amongst yourselves with whatever input we can give you and, and kind of give us some of your thoughts on where do we, where do we, where should we be, which risks to avoid are the most important? Also, I want to note that the CERCLA document that DOE will have to produce is called an engineering evaluation cost mm -hmm. analysis. That's what the ECA right. stands for. So they will have fully developed the cost of what this decommissioning Correct. would cost and that will go out for public comment. So you'll have a, a chance to go through the tables they put together and all of that. So in the CERCLA, and I'm glad you brought that up, Rob, thank you. CERCLA has been around since 95, four, four administrations ago. 1980. 80, so okay, so let me take you back to six administrations. Um, has, has DOE ever not followed through on CERCLA? The very few times at Savannah River site that we've had an issue, we have addressed it. But yeah, they have, and, and at the end, they always have. For Savannah Riverside, I can say that. Okay, so that, that's just, that was my, that was my fear that is the, the department would look, is we, we're going back to CERCLA from 1980, and we're using that as a benchmark to push forward for this, and is it something we really take seriously? Yeah. Or, I, I mean, are you asking if DOE takes CERCLA seriously? Well, I mean, not to get you into the political sphere. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 not getting into the political sphere, but the state of South Carolina is, is, in, is in continuing litigation. Oh, talking about things on high-level waste? I, I, I'm not getting into a specific on anything. I'm just yeah. saying, so we're, we're mandating this to CERCLA, and I'm wondering, is this what the state of South Carolina, are they using CERCLA as, their, as part of their problems, if that makes sense? Or their anger? The is the state of South Carolina suing on the basis of DOE not following through on CERCLA? No. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. We still have some cards up over here. Jim, did you have some additional questions? Yeah. All right. Jim Deal Cap. Um, if I heard the numbers correctly, there's approximately 600 grams of plutonium material or MAR still left in the facility, of which just over 430 are in cabinets one and two. My question is, what form is uh, that material in? Is any of it uh, small enough to be aerial sized or is it uh, captured or fixed in some manner? Or do we know? Yeah, this is Jack Musil, uh, SRNS. Uh, the answer is yes, it's fine particulate. Um, when the process ran in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, they had this ball milling operation in uh, cells one and two. They ground it down and had an average uh, particle size of one micron. Um, because, as Randy uh, mentioned earlier, that's, you know, uh, plutonium-238 is a, has an energetic decay. So it, uh, if it's enough of it, it tends to self-heat, and that prevents it from uh, agglomerating. So um, the assumption is today that the material that was uh, 
dispersed throughout the cell line back in the 70s, 80s is essentially what's there uh, today. It's still on a fine particulate. We do accept, uh, expect some agglomeration where it has built in particle size, making it less dispersible, um, but we don't know to what degree. But yes, that's what it is. It's fine contamination, fine particulate that is adhering to all the surfaces uh, within these cells and glove boxes. And that would include the aluminum uh, corrosion that's taking place? Yes. yes, so the, if I understand your question, the, um, there are a lot of aluminum components within these cells and glove boxes. Uh, the plutonium has, of course, coated those components, and the plutonium actually um, acts kind of like a catalyst. It, uh, it actually accelerates the corrosion of the aluminum. So uh, the aluminum tends to build a, a, a skin and then it'll flake off or spall off. And that's what you see on the floor of the, uh, some of the photos that were shown. Uh, that's what you see on the floor is built up. It's actually, actually it's very light and fluffy. It can be several inches thick, but it's essentially aluminum oxide uh, that the plutonium has caused to spall off the aluminum components. Mike McLean, Dewey. I just want to add one more point to that, Jim. You put your finger exactly on the point that caused the aha moment for DUE and SRNS, and that, yeah, hey, all this aluminum powder, which is also a finely dispersed little powder, that's coming out pretty easily while we're cleaning this up. But we're not seeing the same efficiency of removal of the of the plutonium, which tells us that, okay, it's not as dispersible. It's not as readily removable it's not as easy to get to the soft, chewy, nuclear part of it as one's thought. So it could be plating out, it could be agglomerating, it could be within the, the uh, machines, but it's not as dispersible or removable as, as we assume going in. Is there a slide? Okay. Are you ready? Um, referring to the handout with regards to the first level, 235F, um, what's CAM stand for? Costed air monitor. I'm sorry? Costed air monitor. Constant air monitor. And CA? Contamination area. Okay. And uh, I did notice on there that there's a number of air monitors uh, on the perimeter. However, nothing's shown to like the south or southwest with regards to air permitting. Per uh, I'm sorry, air <laughs> monitoring. So, so we, we, we set the air monitoring up based on our air migration studies. We went in and looked at the airflow of the building. So the areas that were most likely to, to be contaminated, if we had a release, that's where the monitor took place. But it's all based on our, our radiological protection department doing air migration studies and seeing where the air flows throughout the building. And what area of the building are we holding at negative pressure now? The, whole, the, building, the whole, building itself whole building is under negative pressure. The, the glove boxes themselves are under the most negative pressure, if that makes sense. The air flows into east maintenance. So all the airflow goes into east maintenance and into the glove boxes and out. So we never took the other step to put argon back in the cells, just no. negative pressure right now? Correct. Okay. And then just one quick uh, follow-up question on the employee side of it. Uh, we were just sort of wondering, you know, we invest a significant amount of time and resources in training. Are there any incentive programs for these employees, or do they receive any sort of hazardous duty pay when it comes time to perform? No, sir. Bob Smith, CAB. A uh, couple of quick questions. First of all, are the lists that are talked about in Appendix C and K of, are they available to the public for or to CAB for review? Yes, sir. The uh, entire federal facility agreement, including the appendices, is uh, available on the uh, external website, srs.gov. Um, under the Programs tab, there's an Area Completion Program. And when you, um, the Area Completion page uh, has a link to the entire federal facility agreement that's accessible by the public. Okay, thank you. For the second question, does particle size distribution have any effect on the uh, half-life decay of PU-238? No, the particle size doesn't have anything to do with the decay uh, Just rate. to put things in perspective, uh, you know, we're talking 
one, one micron av average. So if you assume a bell-shaped curve, that probably means you've probably got a 0.2 to a 1.2 or one and a half micron size. And the human hair is anywhere from 40 to 120 microns in diameter. So just to get, put things in perspective for everybody else that may not understand, a micron is very, very, very small. So, very small. And then lastly, as I understand it, you've gotten 150 can, canisters of waste from this facility with PU-238. And I'm assuming we're holding these at the site. And if we are, where are we holding them? And why not go ahead and ship them to WIP? So the current, they're already in 235 right now. Uh, going through the process of being drummed in 55 gallon drums. Uh, we'll be making our first shipment to E area over the next several weeks. They'll go to E area and then when, when the, um, we bring characterization equipment back to the site, it'll be characterized, be shipped to, to WIP. I don't know the dates of that. I'm not sure what the schedule is for, um, for WIP to actually take waste from the site again. But there, is, there is a schedule for that. I'm just not familiar with it. Okay. Thank you. In less than two minutes, let's get the last question and answer. Joyce Underwood, Hope Cab. Hopefully this is quick. My question's from Mike. Um, I was of the understanding, based on these presentations, that bringing it down to the ground was too much of a risk to consider, but then you said that Hanford's doing that with their building. Is that an option on the table for this facility? Michael McLance, DOE. Total demolition is always on the table that when EPA, DOE, and DHEC get together, part of the ECA process, part of what the risks are that are, that are evaluated by that core team, the, the, include all the possible end states. The, the regulators have to consider all the possible end states. I personally don't consider decommission or total uh, removal as, as a preferred option because of some of the things that have happened out at Hanford, I'd rather not see happen here. And if I can demonstrate to the regulators that we can safely entomb it where it won't present a future risk to the inhabitants of the South Carolina area, I think that's the better way to go. Okay, thank you. We're on our hard break. We need you back in your seats at one o'clock. That gives you an hour and 15 minutes for lunch. If you are considering a place with table service, you may want to reconsider. <laughs> one o'clock, please. Thank you. Forget to